there was an abandoned factory near a train station that recently had been torn down. A couple of years ago, when it was still standing, it was dilapidated and tagged all over. It looked nice and abandoned. After crossing the train track and hopping a few fences, we got to where the door once was. It was now a boarded up hole. We cranked our crowbars to get it off, and once we did, we found a huge open space, everything stripped, copper wiring and such. Everything dusty, and wooden bits rotted. It smelled dank and mildewy, and was so dark, and it seemed like no one had stepped in there for years. This factory was huge. We decided to pop out from wherever we had, and came to explore another side. Once myself and my three friends came out, we searched along the sides to find another entrance. Then, the flashlight pointed at us. Shit! The cops. God damn, I don't need a trespassing charge. Then, oh shit, he has a gun. I wish this was a cop, and threat of a charge. We were huddled behind a hunk of scrap, and he was bellowing for us to get out. The fear I felt at that moment was unreal. Shaking, clammy, we stepped out. He pointed this bright-ass flashlight at us. His demanding voice went from a low growl to a more frantic, pissed-off one. Who the hell are you, and what are you doing here? Do you know where you are? One of us. The calmest in our misguided Scooby gang said confidently that we will leave and never return, and to please allow us to. He tells he'll walk us out, which was less walking us out, more so blinding us with his flashlight, and directing us to jump the fences and walk away, with his gun pointed at us. Having my back turned towards this weapon-wielding man was terrifying. My option was to do what he said, and hope that he wouldn't shoot, the obvious one. But having to trust that he wouldn't mess us up while vulnerably climbing the chain link fence in the dark will always stay with me. I don't know if there were people maybe taking meth, or what was being done in that factory by its apparent occupants. It's gone now, but that memory gives me chills whenever I pass there. I have a few more instances with abandoned places, but this was the most traumatizing. On another occasion, the same group of friends and I would visit this big, multi-level building that was up in the mountains. It was supposed to be a rec center or country club, but it was stopped in the midst of construction because of the outdated and hazardous materials being used. I believe this was because of asbestos, and a building was built elsewhere, but this one remained, because of financial reasons. On the drive to get there, you pass by some beautiful mountain homes, and then up a half mile long dirt road, but without any lights on, as not to disturb the neighbourhood. We would go into this concrete and metal structure late at night breaking open glow sticks and flinging them around the rooms and spray painting and other kid shit. We frequented it until this incident. The group that had gone there was smaller than our usual, four or five, and was just me and two other friends. We were equipped with a lantern, a flashlight, and just going to hang out. The entrance were these huge metal doors. They were extremely heavy, and it took the two of us to push very hard to move them even a little bit. They were always open. Everything looked normal. Usual amounts of cigarette butts and general trash. Doors open, no other cars or anything around. Everything looked as if no one was there. We entered into a room about the size of a bedroom. That is directly to the right. This one. 
is so dark and small compared to the vast open spaces of the lower levels. So naturally, the most fun to spray glow sticks and have glow in the dark shit in. There is a comically creepy book that is a pretty old children's book sitting there. It's about Mother Goose and tells little tales that we've all heard. The illustrations are super weird looking. Anyway, who doesn't love getting scared? So one of my friends picks it up because we're into this creepy book that we found and are probably going to keep it. We keep walking around the inside and hear squeaks and screeches. This is in the mountains and this is an old building. Whenever we heard noises, our minds go to two places. It was either one, an animal or bug, or a clanky piece of metal, as these things were heavy, or two. We are in an abandoned place at night. Anything heard is going to be scary. We all smoked at the time, and went outside to the stairway that goes into a hole where there is a locked door. Sat on the stairs and smoked. We heard a little high-pitched scream that almost sounded like it could be from a magpie. It creeped us out. And then we began to hear rustling and some sort of soft clomping. Very rhythmic. Almost seemed to be too much for people walking. But probably there was another person here. So we decided to scope it out. We carefully walked the perimeter, but see no people, no cars, nothing indicating that someone else would be there. When we walk to the entrance, my friend jokes that the book is haunted and causing these disturbances. She says that she better give it back to the ghost so it won't get mad or something and throws it towards the entrance. It lands, opens and flips a couple of pages. The night was still very still, not breezy or windy, and we started to freak out. We feel a little unsettled and unsure if we should go back in. We also lost our lighter, so we only had our flashlights as we couldn't light our lantern anymore. Then, this huge creak. One of the doors is shut. How that happened without us hearing is beyond my comprehension as we would have definitely heard it. It's extremely loud. The other door, this heavy ass door that is damn hard to move even one bit, is closing on its own, fairly quickly, and glides shut with a loud bang that makes us all jump. We booked it at that point, ran into the car, and never went back. It doesn't seem that scary to recount, but damn, when I think about what I saw, I feel sick. I have horrible nightmares about this place, when the outcome is much more grisly, so that doesn't help. It was my first night in a new city, and I called my mother to tell her that I had arrived safely. She tells me that the girl I dated when I was 17 as I was now 23, and hadn't heard a peep out of her in five years, called out of the blue looking for me, and left her lumber. Lonely and bored, I rang her up, and had a strange catch-up session. She told me she was engaged to a woman, and that her life after we broke up, was a series of unfortunate events. We hung up on pleasant terms, with no plans to keep in touch. Three days later, I am exiting my building, and who is standing there in the rain, waiting? Yup, her. She had flown 2,500 miles in the middle of the night, because she thought we were destined to be together. She told me how she was so torn up about us not being together, that she had pulled out all of her pubic hair. She also bought her fiance who was as crazy as she and was urging my ex to have a baby with me. I calmly tried telling her that this was insane 
and that I had no interest in any of this, when out of nowhere it all goes black. I wake up to chaos, and my doorman is holding the fiancé down waiting for police. Turns out, she'd hit me on the back of the head with a full bottle of champagne that they'd bought to celebrate with us. Arrests were made, and restraining orders followed. A few years back, my husband and I were living in an apartment in Brooklyn. One night, we decided to check our neighbourhood sex offenders registry, and we discovered that an offender lived in our building. Not a big deal to us, as we didn't have any children at the time, but I should mention that this guy was one creepy looking dude, and I'm talking about wild hair, crazy eyes, and a creeper. We would see the guy walking around the building or neighborhood every now and then. He even set up fruit stands for a while and would wildly yell at people as they passed by. He never bothered us, so we mostly didn't think about him. At the time I was working a crazy job, where I would be at work really late every night and have to take a taxi home. On those nights, my husband would stay up late and wait for me to get home. I was also a bit brain dead when I would get home after a 20 hour shift. So sometimes it would take me a while to find my keys and my husband would have to let me in. One night, I had texted that I was leaving the office at around 3 a.m. About half an hour later, my husband heard our door handle jiggling. Assuming it was me, he got up to let me in. However, something made him look out the peephole first, and there he saw him, the sex offender, completely naked, standing outside the door. As soon as my husband looked out, the guy stopped jiggling the handle, looked up, and put his eyeball right up to the peephole to try and look in, as if he could tell if someone was looking out at him. Then for some reason, my husband opened the door. As soon as he did, the guy tried to force himself in the apartment. Eventually, he got the door closed and called me. I was about a mile away from our building when I received the call, and I was terrified. It must have been obvious, because when we got to the building, the taxi driver asked if he could walk me to the front door. I told him yes, and that I would appreciate it and he stood with me until my husband came from outside to walk me in. We lived on the sixth floor, and from the moment we walked in, you could hear someone running up and down the staircase. We ran to the elevator and jumped in, pressing the closed door button over and over, until the elevator started to move. When we got to about the third floor, the floor where the sex offender was at the time, he began banging on the elevator doors, trying to get in. And then, we heard him go to the stairs, and start running up the stairs to catch us. When we got to our apartment, we called the cops and reported the terrifying situation. It took them two hours to arrive, and by that time the guy had already picked up his clothes and gone home. The cops didn't even come inside the building. They made us go outside and didn't even get out of their cars. When I explained what happened, they responded by saying, You live in Brooklyn, get used to it. Eventually we moved out of the building. But whenever we go back to that neighbourhood, we still see the guy at his fruit stand, yelling at people walking by. A few years ago, I was backpacking in eastern Washington with some friends of mine. I don't know how well you guys know Eastern Washington, but it's pretty much dust, sagebrush, and dirt. We decided to hike up on top of this canyon, and from there, you could see miles and miles of straight nothing. After a few hours of transversing the top of the cliff, we eventually found a little crevasse that kind of took us a little ways underground into a pretty decent sized cave. The cave was filled with little bones, like mice and bats. 
in one of the corners of the cave, there was a rock fixture that jutted up from the ground and almost made a separate room. In the room, we found lots of scratches on the walls, photographs and three bottles with notes in them. While this was kind of off-putting on its own, we figured it was just some sort of joke and we'd find a silly SOS note in the bottles. The scariest part about it all was the photographs were super ordinary, of families and normal people, and two of the notes in the bottles made no sense at all. While it was English, it was pretty much straight gibberish. None of the words made any sense in context with the other words. The third bottle had a super ordinary letter talking about what they'd been up to, something you'd send to a fairly distant relative after not speaking with them for a while. I don't really know what to think of it all. I feel like it could have easily just been someone joking around, but it was almost too strange for that. Under a church in my local town, there is this green door covering with no handle, because it's a wooden, real fake door. Legit though, it's a door with no hinges. It's meant to just stop access into there. I'd like to mention the door is on the back side of the church and outside the church grounds. There's no road near it. One day, me and my mates saw someone had smashed the wooden door thing to pieces. As typical teenagers, we wanted to explore, but me being me, I said, we should research it. In our town, there are quite a lot of tunnels linking houses and shops that are usually chained off, but a lot of them are still open and haven't been explored. This was the first time when we wouldn't have to ask a shop owner to have a look. I found that they were apparently all these ghosts, including the Blue Drum Boy, who got killed during a war in the early 11th century. My friend believes in all the paranormal stuff, so he got his cross and ghost shit ready. I packed a 500 lumen torch to light up the place and had a pack of batteries spare, as well as a walkie talkie and all the other essentials. It was the early hours and pitch black, and we went in. Everyone was completely silent as we crept down the stairs. And suddenly, we realized there was a 90 degree turn where we couldn't see the right. Everyone was scared shitless to go down first. So my mate lit a red flare and threw it in. Then we all walked in together. There was this huge room with another doorway. We looked around the first room finding needles and blood. We carried on through the doorway and found a grate that had a ladder off it. Obviously we were buzzing and thought what a great idea to cut through the lock and climb down the ladder. Three out of the four of us were down when the largest of us all started climbing. It was rickety and kind of rusted, and it broke when he was halfway. The exit from the ladder was a tunnel, completely dry and pitch black, but he fell and shattered both ankles. Oh, and there was a bad stench. Yeah, bad situation as we couldn't get back up the ladder, and my mate couldn't walk, and he was the biggest guy, so we had to carry him. Basically, when me and one other mate carried on, leaving the others to find help, as the walkie-talkies got no reply, we walked past rotting rat corpses, live rats, and a shit ton of blood stains. After about 30 minutes of walking, after about a mile, we found a crossroad. Straight, left, or right. Basically, left was a dead end, right was a dead end, and straight had a ladder. The ladder was rusted, 
and we were scared to climb it. But I climbed it, and found someone with a needle in their arm, dead. Their face was rotting, and I was about to be sick. The ladder led to identical rooms, but no lock on their grate. I went back down the ladder, got the others to come back, and we managed to get my large mate up and out and took him to the hospital. We couldn't say where we went or talk about the dead guy, because we knew it would be trespassing. We had a neighbour before who was possessed by demons. Apparently, she made a deal with the demon when she was younger, but it followed her. When she got possessed, four or five men were holding her down, but she trashed them like toys. A pastor was called, as the whole neighbourhood watched, and when the exorcism started, her body twitched and spasmed. She also levitated less than an inch above the bed. The exorcism was very exhausting, and she said that she would just go with them, as in the demons. But they told her to trust in God, because if not, she would be dragged to hell. After the first day, they thought that they had moved all the demons, but some of them were still holding on to her. They did another exorcism, and finally they were all removed. They removed a total of six demons within her. And I also saw a news story on TV, where several students in a school in a very rural area were possessed. What's weird about this is they started speaking Latin, German and Greek. Languages that are not taught in schools here in Asia, the Philippines. I found it incredibly creepy, and is certainly one of the scariest things I've heard in my life. I spent various stretches of time backpacking and camping throughout the US and have seen some strange things. My brother and I came across an abandoned trailer town of sorts that scared the hell out of us. We also came across a rundown and really, really small town out in New Mexico that seemed to have one person living in it. On the fact that there were still some food and supplies there that were just fairly fresh. We spent a couple of days there trying to find the person, just to find out why they were staying in the town, and we never found a soul. We also found the skeletal remains of an unknown number of deer, ranging from bucks to fawns, ensnared in barbed wire fencing that encompassed a 10 by 10 area in the Ozarks. A few of the skulls topped the fence posts and there was one post in the middle of the area that had decaying deer bodies. It looked to be two, but there were only six hooves jutting out of the wreckage, and they were wrapped around it. We found a dummy hanging from a tree while in the Yukon Territory of Canada, literally out in the middle of the woods. No reason for it as far as we know. We also came across a dead junkie on a road out to Olympia, Obviously OD, as he had his arm tied and a needle in his hand. Eyes were glazed over, and staring right ahead with his mouth slightly ajar. I need to give you a bit of background. When this occurred, I was not living the healthiest of lifestyles. I quit using heroin when I was 25, and moved to France for five years. I just recently moved back to the States this past summer. This is relevant because it speaks to my mindset at the time, all about how this occurred, and why I was comfortable taking the absurd risks I took. I was a drug fiend. Anyway, onto the story. When I was 20, I had moved from Baltimore to the Eastern Shore thinking the distance would help mitigate my habit. It didn't. 
Instead, I just ended up driving to Baltimore every couple of days and buying several hundred dollars worth of heroin instead of just buying less on a daily basis. In the process, I got to know a lot of good people, some of them hacks. In Baltimore, a hack is someone who operates a cabbie illegally. Often they take people into the city to pick up their drugs or just charge half the rate of a legit cab driver. I had met an older guy at a Dunkin' Donuts in Dundalk who did this. Now, I wasn't into the habit of using hacks, but one night, my ride went down a one-way street the wrong way in front of a police officer, and we were pulled over and searched. It ends up the idiot had bought his stash of pot with him. So we were arrested, and God was I pissed. Around midnight that night, they released me. It ends up that not only had my friend admitted ownership of the marijuana, but the reason they'd used to search us, that his license was showing up as suspected, was bull. And my friend's lawyer had called them up on it. So there I was, in the middle of Baltimore City with no ride and nowhere to go. Dope sick in the middle of December. They released the men and women separately, and my friend's cell phone was still off at the time when I tried to call it. It ends up he'd been released several hours earlier, but had left his phone in the truck. For anyone who hasn't had the pleasure of being arrested, they impound your vehicle. You're out of luck re-getting your vehicle back. Not to mention another couple of hundred dollars in the hole. As I mentally ran through my list of options, I remember the hack I'd met earlier that week and decided to give him a try. I figured that at the least, if he was still awake, I could pay him to help me cope and drop me off at the Greyhound bus station to wait out the night. Well, I called, and not only was he up and about, but he was also only about a 10 minute drive away from where I was being released. The fact that he was still up and about at one in the morning may have given normal people pause. I just assumed he was probably a crackhead, tweaker, or some such, and wrote it off as luck. Within half an hour, he showed up, and I clambered into the long grey sedan, just grateful to be out of the cold and back on solid ground. Now, to give you an idea of the way this guy came off, the very best I can think to describe him is grey. Everything about him just grey. His vehicle was a medium dinged up grey. His hair was very longish and a deep, solid grey. Even his palace seemed grey. I remember he had the face of a postmenopausal woman. Sort of jolly, if you know what I mean. Soft. In retrospect, the guy was creepy as all get out. But, at the time, he seemed unexceptional. And really, in the drug world, there are so many weird people that unless someone comes off as blatantly volatile, you eventually learn to just ignore the crazy. If you don't, you'll drown in it. We managed to cop in Baltimore. There's always someone out. I asked the guy to take me to the Greyhound station, just wanting to get well and to curl up, till I could think about catching a bus. And he just sort of looked at me, looked down, looked back up, and then asked if I just wanted to go watch TV at his place till the buses began running. Looking back, I remember feeling a bit hesitant, but the man seemed so unexceptional, such a non-entity, that I couldn't imagine him being a threat. And if I'm entirely honest, I just wanted a clean, warm place to get it on. 
I was well beyond dope sick at this point. All my consuming thoughts were to just get straight. Taking my silence for hesitation, I remember him telling me not to worry. And he wasn't going to try anything. I ought to have mentioned that I am a five foot six, a hundred pound female. Twenty years old at the time. And the bus station wasn't the safest place for a tiny female like myself to be hanging out at two o'clock in the morning. That he was just trying to help. Well, I thanked him. I said sure, and we proceeded to drive out towards the county. To this day, I'm still not sure in which direction we even went in. Just that wherever it was that he lived, it was about an half an hour outside of the city. And that it was not in the woods, but in a heavily wooded area. As we neared his house, he started acting a bit strange. Not enough to set off the alarm bells yet, but still. I'll never forget him saying that either the police chief or the chief's son lived in the same cul-de-sac that he did, that they were friends, and that the guy had helped him out of what turned to be a few predicaments. The house was right on a lake, with a dock in the backyard, and I have no idea what county this was in, and no one I've tried describing it to has ever been able to pinpoint it either. It was totally alien to me. We pulled into his driveway, and I was shocked to see that his house was closer to being a McMansion than the hovel I assumed I was in for. He would go on to tell me as he parked and we walked up to his door, that it had belonged to his mother, who had recently passed away. Here this ratty little man with a ratty little car, in his ratty little clothes, is living in an extremely well and expensive house, driving around all day and night for pocket change, and basically living in a Dunkin' Donuts. I was a bit more sceptical. When we went inside, the situation became even stranger, but at least more familiar. More in line with what I'd seen the guy do thus far. The house was covered in two things, dust and knickknacks. And when I say covered, I mean covered. Every square inch surface space was covered in a tacky little porcelain angel and dollar store crap. Shelves, tables, the top of the ginormous odd box television, even the kitchen was covered in them. The kitchen itself I only saw for a brief moment, but I'll never forget how even the sink was filled with the things. There were the obligatory dollies that all old people seemed to have in spades, all of them, coated in dust and discoloured. I asked where the bathroom was, and excused myself to go get high. I was getting pretty weirded out at this point, and I just wanted to get straight to it in order for me to decide what to do. The first thing I did was went back to the living room, which was the first room you walked into when you came into the door. I didn't want to go any deeper into the house. I really wanted to take a look at the lock on the door, and to create an exit strategy, and hope I didn't really need one. The hope was quickly dashed. The first thing the guy did was bring me a glass of water and a handful of pills. I asked him what the pills for, and he said to sleep. Now it's 3am. At this point I have to be at the bus station by 6, at most and we have maybe two hours before we need to leave. I tell him that I don't think that's a great idea, since falling asleep isn't on the agenda, that we didn't have time even for a quick nap. Well, he starts to become pretty insistent that I take the pills. Well, he starts to become pretty insistent that I take the pills. Believe me, 
If we weren't so out in the middle of nowhere, not to mention it being December and bitter, bitter cold at this point, I'd have booked it. Instead, I sort of laughed and took the two pills out of his hands and stuck them in my mouth and took a sip of water saying, well, what the hell? Immediately he brightened and shuffled off to get me another glass of water which I requested. Looking back, I shouldn't have even drunk the bloody water. I spat out the pills and shoved them in the seat of the sofa. The whole time we'd been talking about little things. Baltimore, local politics, music, nothing deep. At this point, he starts asking me about my chemicals. About drugs. Specifically, what sort of drugs will knock someone out, but not harm them? How much you need, or what for someone? Say, for someone tiny, like myself. I try to act as if this is entirely normal conversation. At this point, it seems that my existence is depended on whether or not I register how abnormal the entire situation was. I think my thought process at the time was that I couldn't act as if I knew anything was going on. And as time went on, which you'll see what I mean in a bit, was that I couldn't act as if I knew what was going on. That I couldn't act as if there was anything strange or alarming occurring. That he would be stupid to let me leave and let me live if he knew that I knew exactly what was going on here, that I need to seem like a non-threat. The whole time we are having this discussion, by the way, the guy kept trying to get behind me. At one point he succeeded and started rubbing my shoulders. I just laughed, said I wasn't a fan of massages, and that I needed to run to the bathroom. When I came back, I made sure to sit on the side of the sofa that was against the wall, and I'm looking around for a phone. But I don't want to ask for one, because I don't want him to know that my cell phone is dead. Yeah, another great stroke of luck. My cell phone had died about five minutes after I called the creep to come and pick me up. Now this whole time, the guy had been pacing around the living room, sitting for a few minutes only to get back up again, walk back and forth a bit, and then, of course, sit down. He'd begun talking about his mother, how she collected these knickknacks, and how she'd died, a heart attack, and how he'd been thinking about renovating the house, but hadn't had the heart to make any changes to anything yet. So he says he wants to show me something. He wants to show me the upstairs. Why I didn't run screaming out of that place I didn't know. I think part of me was still very much hoping that I was misreading the situation. And this guy was just lonely and creepy and socially maladaptive. Not actually dangerous or anything. But here we were. Yet one more horror filled trope coming into play creepy obsession with mother and bizarre dust-filled house, perfectly preserved in memory of her, down to the last glass that she used sitting on the kitchen table. I shit you not. And now the guy wants to show me the upstairs. He wants to show me her room. So I follow him up the stairs. At first, he makes it obvious he wants me to go up before him, but I wasn't having any of that. We get to the second story, and there were three. I never made it to the third, however, and turn off down this hallway, and he opens the first door to the left and goes in. Honestly, I'm half expecting to see the body of his dead mum lying on the bed or something and find myself seriously relieved when I find myself standing in just one more dust-coated room full of crap. I don't remember much about the room. I remember the bed was made, and that I couldn't tell if the comforter was dark 
or just covered in so much dust that it appeared that way. He gestured for me to sit down, and I obliged. What followed was the worst experience. He sat down on the end of the bed, next to me, and began talking about his mother. After a bit, he looks at me and said, You're so beautiful. I bet little girls really like you. I tried to lead the conversation back to his mother. He gets up and walks over to the far wall of the bedroom, starts referring to our earlier conversation about drugs and knocking someone out. He asks me what I would use to knock out a child, what I would use to keep a child knocked out for long periods of time safely. I'm trying at this point to act as if I'm still on point, as if I'm not finding this line of conversation to be dreadful, creepy, and horrible. I tell him I really didn't know. I'm just a dope friend, not a chemist. He asks about heroin, and if that would be safe. At this point, I've just had it, and I think he could tell. And he says, I want to show you something. I begin to protest, and tell him that I have to use the restroom, but he insists. He pushes on the cheap wood panelling on the wall, and a large square of it swings open. He gestures inside, says he's been working on it for a few years, that it's just big enough for a small woman, but made for a child. It's a sort of cot, and there are loops on the end for rope and some other restraints, I'm sure. I noped out of the bedroom and down the stairs. I didn't run. I just told him I had to use the restroom again. While I'm walking, shaking down the stairs, I pull my cell phone out of my purse and mimic dialing on it. I was lucky that he stayed behind too close up the bedroom and that the thing in the wall, so that he didn't see my phone wasn't even turning on. I pretended to be having a conversation with a friend of mine, and at that point he showed up, began loudly recounting that we had transpired the evening to my friend, and I told him how I called the nice gent we had met. I'd been with my friend Tom at the time we'd met the guy, and that he had picked me up, and that I was now at his house, but we would be leaving shortly and then I pretended that my friend had offered to come pick me up from the bus stop. And in one respect, I was lucky. The guy knew I was living out of town, but he didn't know I was living four hours away or that any friend of mine would have to make that hellish long trip if they were going to come and collect me. I told my friend that I'd head out for the bus station ASAP and that I'd see him soon. I still remember the look on the guy's face as I said that. It darkened. You know the look that snotty, spoiled little kids get when someone actually dares them and tells them no? It was like that. It was like that look, but worse. There was something almost perverse about seeing it so openly displayed on the face of a 50-something-year-old man. So I started to grab my purse and zip up my coat, all the while gibbering on about how my friend remembered him and had said to tell him hi. It seemed at the time that there were two things that were of the utmost importance at that moment. The first, to make him feel that I hadn't found him or anything he said or displayed. Odd. I didn't want him to think I would be some sort of threat to his plans or his well-being if he ever let me leave. Secondly, I wanted him to know that he was identifiable, and that if someone, at least someone, who could identify him, knew I was with him. This is pretty much the end of the story. Although I had one more far worse encounter with the same guy a couple of weeks after, he took me to the bus station and acted shitty the entire time we were driving there. The second encounter convinced me not only that I was lucky to be alive, but that I had spent several hours in the home of a serial killer. 
Do I think he had done anything yet at the time? That I spent at the terrifying early morning in his house? No. I think he was gearing up, though. And by the second brief encounter I had with the guy, I'm positive he had. I don't know how to put it. That uncertainty he displayed me with was gone. I think by that point, he'd crossed the line. I took down his license plate number as he was leaving that morning. And I did contact a friend of mine who was a police officer and gave him a description of the creep's house, car, his license number, first name, cell phone number, and a detailed account of what transpired that morning in his home. A year or so later, I would receive a call from the very same officer, asking if I still had a record of the info I'd given him. Unfortunately, I no longer did, and the owner of the Dunkin' Donuts on Eastern Avenue that the creep usually did frequent had no information on him. The last he'd seen of him, the creep had come by to show him a car he'd purchased. It was black and a sedan, and that's all the owner knew. I was on high alert for a week or so. I'd received a couple of sketchy calls from a blocked number, but nothing I couldn't pin on the creep. My life went back to normal. My normal, at least. And after a couple of weeks, I was able to convince myself that I had exaggerated the whole encounter. After all, I was still breathing. So one day, Tom and I decided to take a trip to the city to pick up my stash for the next few days. Usually, when we went to Baltimore, we'd pick up about five or six hundred dollars worth of scramble, 70 pills low. And this would last the two of us about two days, sometimes three. I had a hell of a habit. Well, on this day in particular, we decided to pick up a bit more than usual. I can't remember why. But the entire trip was cursed from the get-go. We were late leaving the shore. And there was an accident in the harbour tunnel that ended up backing up traffic for a good three hours. By the time we made it to eastern Baltimore, my contact had dipped. I ended up getting in touch with another guy who sold out of Dundalk. So we went down to Erdman Avenue. The same Erdman Avenue of the Creeps Dunking Donuts. And so, I had Tom park in the Goodwill parking lot, so that I could go find my guy. Most of my contacts knew Tom, but this guy I was going to meet was one of those paranoid hitters, and wouldn't serve me if he even knew Tom's truck was in the vicinity of where we were meeting. So I had to hoof it. I can't remember exactly where it was he wanted me to meet him, but I'm fairly certain that it was on Dundark Avenue or Merritt Boulevard, one of the large roads that runs through Dundark like a vein. Whenever I'm in the city and I have to walk anywhere, I employ the look down, look at your feet, never look a stranger in the eye, if a car honks their horn at you, do not respond method of minding my own business. A large part of the reason I do this is the unspoken reason. It's because a lot of people will assume that you're a hooker if they see you walking. Generally, if you don't respond when they honk their horns and holler at you, after a bit, they'll probably leave you alone. And don't forget the police and the undercovers. It's their job to harass you a bit and to see if you'll respond, to see if you're doing business or merely an unlucky member of the vehicle tier of society. On this particular day, I remember being more than a little spooked at the absence of traffic. It wasn't a nice day. It was overcast. Grey. A standard January afternoon in Baltimore. But it wasn't abnormally shitty either. There was certainly no reason for it to be so quiet. I was walking down one of Dundalk's larger roads. The traffic should have been steady. There should have been a few people shopping and walking about at least. But no. It was just me and the occasional ragtag car. I was about a mile down from the road from my meeting point with my dealer when a black sedan pulled up next to me. It was the creep. 
He opened the passenger side door from inside and told me to get in. Now I seriously considered altering this story from my point of view to make myself look like and feel like less of a retard. But so far, I've been entirely honest in my retelling of this encounter with the guy. So I'm not going to start lying. Anyway, please cut me some slack. Over the three or four weeks that had passed since the incident at his house, I'd spent a fair amount of time talking myself into believing that I had over-dramatised the whole encounter. That maybe, that little room in the wall, with the cot, hadn't been what I thought it was. In short, I had tried to convince myself that I was just a heroin addled junkie who had blurred the lines in between reality and fantasy. So when the creep pulled up and told me to get into his car, there were a lot of reasons why I did that, instead of doing what a sane person would do, which is start screaming, running, and pitching a fit and just generally noping the hell out of there. I've tried to figure out that day why I did that, and all I can say is that I had been convincing myself that there was no way I'd actually experienced what I thought I had, and my dislike at the feeling that I'd been a giant coward. I sort of felt compelled to face the guy, and verify that no, there was nothing strange going on, and that it really had all been in my head. But at the same time, there was another dynamic at play. The fact that I was still sickeningly afraid of the creep. I remember pulling back from the open door of the car and looking around, looking at the whole lot of no one and nothing on the street, and thinking that if I didn't go willingly, he could easily run me down on his own. I told him I was busy, and I told him I was on my way to meet my guy, and he said that's fine. He'd take me the rest of the way and drop me off, that he'd even take me back to wherever I was going afterwards. if. I wanted me to. So I got into the car. I was absolutely terrified. Then I fell back into the same routine I'd utilised the first time round, acting disoriented and high, harmless and glad to see him. I asked him what he'd been up to and he said in a perfectly monotone voice that he tried to call me and why hadn't I answered. I explained that I used throwaway cell phones, and that I had acquired a new one since my minutes had run out on the other. Now I remember I said that I'd only been about a mile or less from my meeting point with my dealer when the creep pulled up. My hopes were pinned on him keeping his word, and actually taking me to where I needed to go. If that happened, I thought that everything would be okay, and that I didn't need to worry. But of course it didn't. When he blew through the light we needed to turn at, I told him he missed my stop. Oh, he replied, don't worry, I'll take you to where you need to go. I just want to talk to you for a minute first. I felt sick to my stomach. He pulled off Dundalk Avenue, and I could see that he was turning into one of those little parks that they have dotted throughout the city. Parks with jogging paths and a few token toys and swings for children. If I recall correctly, there was some sort of school or other government building in the background. I remember thinking that as soon as he slowed down just a bit, I was going to jump out of that car. I also remember thinking that I need to relax, that if he even thought for a moment that I was beginning to freak out, my chances of him slowing down or giving me any sort of out would be nil. You see... The whole time, he had been going on about how he was looking for sedatives and wanted to get some Xanax, as well as a cocktail of other drugs. How he'd really like my help, and how he'd been scouting the park we were in at the moment, as well as other parks throughout the city and county, and how he was certain that with someone like me by his side to help lure little girls back to his house, he could fulfil his dream, he said. And here is what terrified me the most. He could use the dock behind his house to get rid of the bodies. I've never disliked myself more than I did that day. 
the whole time he'd been talking about all of this. I'd been doing two things. One, I had began to slouch down in the passenger seat with my eyes almost shut, trying to act as if I'd nodded out. I could only see him a little out of the slit in the corner of my eye. The whole time he was talking about this and that, and how he'd been rooted around underfoot in front of his seat. Slowly, sneakily, as if he was trying not to make any noise. So when I could respond to him, I would make a warning gesture, like move my hand to indicate I was about to open my eyes. The last thing I wanted to do was to make him feel like he'd been caught and that he had to pull whatever it was out immediately. The second thing I'd been doing was how I was responding to his questions. Instead of acting freaked out or upset, I was trying to act like I was on board with all of this, but not too on board. I was trying to act like I was considering it, like I had the option to do this if I wanted or not. I didn't want him to think of me as a victim, and I didn't want him to think that I was thinking of myself as a victim. I was hoping that if I acted like his peer, like a potential partner in crime, that he would treat me like one, or at least pretend to for long enough for me to leave the car safely. He was starting to circle the park when he began to slow down significantly. Through the slit opening of my eye through my eyelashes, I could see him reach as far down as he could under the front seat all the while watching me intently to see if I'd move. I knew it was time to get the hell out of the dodge, because whatever he had, whatever he was looking for down there, he did not want me to know about it. And that terrified me. And God was I lucky. I was lucky because at the same time that he was slowing down, another car had come out of nowhere and was slowing down next to his vehicle. He sat up and I bolted. I just grabbed the door handle and fell out of the door and ran without ever looking back. I pulled my cell out of my purse and called my friend and had him pick me up from one of the stores on the corner of the avenue. I was bawling, terrified at my own stupidity, at how close I knew I had come to ending up in someone's psycho dungeon. This was how he referred to the hole in the wall during the run that day. All because I didn't listen to my instincts, or hell, just pure common sense. I cried and cried and cried, thinking about the creep and all the things he said he wanted to do to little girls. This, for all intents and purposes, is the end of my encounter with the creep. But two or three months after all of this happened, I received a phone call one day, and I didn't answer it because the number was unfamiliar. Later that week, I checked my voicemail. It was the creep. He changed his number and wanted to let me know he had finished renovating the house and wanted me to come see it. He said he put an ad in some paper and was letting out various rooms at boarding rooms for women only. And that he had some interesting ideas he wanted to talk over with me. I forwarded the new number to my police officer friend and changed my own. Despite what I said earlier when I had told the creep that my number I had changed and I used throwaway phones, my number had never changed. I just never answered because I didn't know, and prior to our second meeting, had not bothered to set up my voicemail at that point in time. Over the years, I've tried on and off to find the creep's house. Now, with Google Maps, I may even be able to narrow down the county. The Dunkin' Donuts he hung out at every morning for years is the one on Edmund Avenue. Google Maps shows the Dunkin' Donuts with a bus stop out front for anyone that's interested in checking it out. I still think the best bet is the owner of the Dunkin' Donuts. The creep hung out there for years, picking up business, drinking coffee, and talking to the owner. I refuse to believe they didn't know each other a bit better than the owner made out or that the creep just never showed up there again. I can believe that he may have called it with that place after a brief encounter, but I think it's almost a given that he'd have gone back eventually. The only other point of possible identification I can think of is the cop that the creep claimed lived in the same cul-de-sac that he did. 
He said it was either the police chief or his son. I remember him seeming to find that amusing, and he laughed about his friendship with the cop. But they were on the river of the cul-de-sac, and it had to be accessed via a bridge from the main road. Beyond this recollection, I'm tapped. Anyone out there with addiction issues, you can beat them. I was a heroin addict from 19 to 25, when I picked up and moved overseas. For me, it took relocating halfway around the world to get far enough away from my addiction to overcome it. But I'm going on six years clean this April, and I'm thankful that my life doesn't consist of elements like the above any longer. If I can do it, anyone can. My friends and I found a 22-year-old girl face down in the mud with both her legs broken and compound fractures. She had no cell phone, no water, and no food, and nothing to keep her warm. Her friend was dead. Here's the backstory. My two friends and I were hiking in a pretty popular spot in our area. It's in a 150 foot waterfall that takes about 45 minutes of uphill hiking to get to. We decided to go bouldering around the bottom of the waterfall, as there are various little pools and boulders where the water runs off from the waterfall. This bouldering trail is not on the main trail, and not very many hikers ever veer off the main trail. When we found her, obviously we called 911 and gave her any supplies we had. Eventually a helicopter showed up and they flew her to the nearest hospital. Turns out, she was hiking with her friend the night before, when they both fell off the waterfall. Her friend must have gone and gotten help, but unfortunately died less than a hundred yards from where the girl was found. So no one even knew she was hurt, or that she was even there. It's a miracle she was still alive, and mind-blowing to think what she had gone through when we found her 20 hours later. I lived in a national park by myself for three months. Several times when I was going back to my trailer for the day, I would hear music, like a music box or ice cream truck. It was always loud and sounded like it was coming from somewhere over my head. One day, I decided to look for the source, so I followed the dirt road past my trailer. The music continued. I couldn't tell if I was getting closer or not, and I had my eyes on the trees. I looked down, just in time to avoid stepping on a snake. I scrambled, but it didn't move. I realised it was dead, and it wasn't alone. There were half a dozen dead copperheads stretched out in the road, looking in the same direction. I went back to get my car because I couldn't bring myself to step over them. But by the time I got my keys, the music had stopped playing and I didn't hear it again. This happened to my wife. She is an RN, and she was on float to another unit helping out, as she normally worked cardiac. But she was helping out on this one occasion in the Alzheimer's unit. She was saving a particular patient for last, as the patient was very well known to be a real pain. Very old and mean to everyone, and just generally tried to make the nurses miserable. She and the respiratory therapist got to the patient's room at the time, so they decided to tackle her together. They got to the room, and the patient had smeared shit all over the walls of the bathroom and the hospital room. She was standing on the bed, screaming and jumping up and down. The two of them somehow got the patient calm, got the horrible mess cleaned up, and got their job done. She said it took about three hours. They then went and put a big do not disturb sign on the door to make sure the patient could calm down and get some sleep. They were standing, one person on each side of the door, 
herself and the respiratory therapist catching their breath and proclaiming how much that sucked when they spotted someone. A big farmer looking guy wearing a John Deere baseball cap, overalls, a red plaid checkered shirt and big work boots coming down the hospital hallway and he looked kind of annoyed. He walked right past them into the patient's room, slamming the door open. My wife caught the door on the backswing and marched right into the room after him, with the respiratory therapist right behind her, planning on dragging him back out and giving him a piece of her mind. When she got in, he was not in the room. There was no sign of the person she followed in. She looked under the bed, she looked in the bathroom, and she checked behind all the curtains. She even made sure the window still would not be open. No sign of the farmer at all. She then noticed the patient was sitting upright in bed, just kind of staring off into space. So she asked her, Did you see someone come into the room? The patient replied, Yes, it was my daddy. He said he was coming to take me home tonight, and that you mean people won't be able to hurt me anymore. She responded with, That's great. How about you get some rest before he comes to collect you? The patient then lay down and went to sleep. The patient died that night. My wife and the respiratory therapist swapped stories to make sure they were not crazy. They both saw it. There was a guy on my shift who got a domestic call on the other side of the county. He responded to the house and found a guy running laps around the yard of the home. The family said in broken English that the guy was possessed and they had called a witch doctor to help out who was on the way. The crazy guy ran up to the officer and got in his face. So the officer detained him by placing him in handcuffs and laying him down on his back on the porch until he could figure out what was going on. While talking with the family, he noticed that the guy was moving. The heels of his feet were on the ground and his body was flat. But his upper body was three inches off the ground and his hands were still behind his back handcuffed. The dude was levitating. The officer pushed him to the ground, took off the handcuffs, and told the family how they should have him committed, and left. No one ever went to follow up. I hope he got the help he needed. Me and a few good friends decided to explore this abandoned child's hospital that we heard about that was in a small village about an hour away from us. We get there, and it's this huge plot of land, trees surrounding the whole place, and the building in the centre. It looked extremely creepy. We had to climb up the wall to get inside, as we couldn't get in on the ground floor, and we had to go through a window that was ajar. After climbing through, the place was a mess. Rubble everywhere, but it looked completely desolate, as if no one had been inside for years. So anyway, we went straight up to the roof, sat, and had a few beers and then went home. I decided to go back a few days later with my girlfriend to have a proper look around because I wanted to explore it. We went into the building and immediately there was a very different vibe unlike the other night. We jumped over the broken staircase to get to the ground floor and this was next to a large heavy duty wooden door with multiple boats and chains over it, and found a trap door, with a ladder underneath it which led into the basement. I convinced my girlfriend to come with me, but she wouldn't explore the basement when we were there, 
just stayed at the bottom of the ladder with her torch while I had a quick look around. This is when it got really scary. I walked past some machines in the small room, which was completely empty, with the exception of a kicked over chair and a noose hanging from a pipe directly above my chair. I shat myself and turned around to leave when on the wall there was red graffiti saying, don't come back. Needless to say, I haven't been back. My girlfriend told me after that she felt I was gone for about an hour, when I knew I was only gone for about five to ten minutes. And she told me that she kept hearing whispers from the dark corridors, and the trapdoor fell shut above her at one point for no apparent reason. It was a very scary place. And I would love to go back with more people, but damn, that shit absolutely terrified me. There is an abandoned East Coast insane asylum that I've often seen posted on YouTube as well as other places on the internet. I personally have been there around 10 or 15 times over the course of a decade and each time I found something new, as the complex is very spread out and very massive. What I've never seen, posted, or never mentioned, however, is the maze of tunnels underneath the complex. Connecting each building is a subterranean network of tunnels for steam, water, sewage, and electricity. The tunnels are roughly 10 to 15 feet underground and quite long. They lead into the basement of each structure in a portion of the complex with an emergency escape hatch that leads out into the woods between buildings in a portion. One weird thing is that most of the entrances to the tunnel system are hidden in the walls. I exited through a door once and found myself in a room that was the complex's post office, where I'd literally been five times before and had never noticed that there was a hidden passage integrated into the wooden panelling. The complex has been abandoned for 20 to 30 years, so parts of the tunnel are very wet with leaking water. When you're down in there, you constantly hear environmental noise, as well as echoes from your own movements. There is nothing reflective down there, and there are no outside sources of light. If you don't have a bright enough flashlight, it can get kind of difficult to make out features of things in the distance. And you're relying a lot upon the slight tonal differences of what you can see to determine what something is off in the distance before you're right up onto it. If you go out on a moonless night and shine an LED pen light against a concrete wall from 15 feet away, you would get an idea from what I'm talking about. Now for the terror. First of all, I have a stupid habit of going into these places by myself. I've recently started correcting this, because you never know when an accident could happen, leaving you alone underground in the dark. The last time I was in the tunnels, I was by myself, with a single AA battery powered 75 to 100 lumen LED flashlight. My second mistake was that during this excursion, I decided to follow the tunnel down to what I thought was the water treatment building for the complex. The tunnel slopes downwards, so the leaking water previously mentioned runs down and collects at the tunnel's end. So at the end of the tunnel, I enter this large room with two 15 foot tall water storage tanks. There is probably an inch of water and muck on the floor 
which makes a really gross noise when you walk in it. I am still standing, looking around with my flashlight, and from the opposite side of the room, I hear it. There is someone else in this underground room with me. I shine my flashlight across the room. I don't see anything, but I keep hearing the wet footprints. All of a sudden, I shine the light on this human-shaped object that is just black. There is no difference in shading or anything, just like a shadow against the peach-colored concrete wall. I stammer out, hello, and all of a sudden, I can see these person's two eyes flash up, reflecting back my flashlight. But that's it. I don't know if the person was in a guile suit or what, but it was impossible to make out anything distinguishable. I don't know what kind of weirdo sets out in full black get-up to rummage around underground. So at this point I flip out. I spin 180 degrees on my heels and bolt. I'm flying up the inclined tunnel, slipping and sliding all over the place on the damn concrete. I fell a handful of times, sprained my wrist badly, and got a number of cuts on my one knee. That run through the underground tunnels felt like an eternity. If you've ever seen the subway scene from the movie 28 Weeks Later, that's the closest thing I can approximate to. It was the closest thing I've ever experienced to a living nightmare. I have never been so terrified in all my life. Looking back, I'm sure whoever I met down there in the dark was probably as terrified as I was, unless they were crazy as hell. I have no reason to believe they followed me, and they probably ran back the way they came, as did I. I noticed that they didn't have a flashlight on. So what I think probably happened is that they had noticed my light and pulled a hoodie up over their head, turned off their light, and tried to hide as best they could. My best friend dreamed about my stepfather getting stabbed. My family was pretty white trash, and on one particular evening, my uncle and stepfather got into an altercation outside of our house where my stepfather got stabbed in the back. He fell on me coming back inside, and in the process, I got coated in blood. The cops were called, and he was taking in an ambulance as my mother and myself drove to the hospital. This was about 1am. This is before the internet and cell phones and all that jazz, so there was no way for anyone beyond our next door neighbours to know about this. When we returned back to the house, Four or five hours later, there was a message on the answering machine from my best friend. She was crying and apologising for calling so late, but asking me to call her right away, because she had a dream of me being covered in blood. The message was the time stamped as the same time the incident occurred, round about 1am. We had missed her call, because we were outside with the paramedics. I was doing a two-month internship at a very famous forensic hospital in Germany prior to my studies. Many patients there are thought too dangerous to ever be released, which effectively means even if they're due to be released, they stay in the hospital. The hospital I worked in were separated in two sectors. The first was for acute psychotic patients. There you had the screaming, schizophrenic and acute dangerous people. For example, when you got stuck on an acid trip and killed someone, you came there. Some of the patients there were relocated relatively fast to normal psychiatric hospitals. The second one was mostly for patients 
who were already locked in for several years. They appeared not as obviously insane as the others, mostly because their medication was adjusted really well during the time. That's the place I worked in. We had a lot of paedophiles in there, but they were more pitiful to be honest, and not really dangerous or creeps. They got medication which suppressed their libidos, and as a side effect, they were really sluggish and appeared to be kind of dumb. But there was one patient who really terrified me. In contrast to most of the others, he was really intelligent, cultivated, attractive, and extremely charming. He was some kind of accountant before he got into the psychiatric hospital. Apparently he had a competitor at work, who he killed, partially skinned, and then decided to place the corpse in the office to show the others what happened when you got in his way. After 10 years doing forensic psychiatry, he tortured his roommate to death at night over some minor argument. This dude really terrified me. I'd never met such a cold, manipulative character like him. He had this special, super creepy look on his face when he was alone with you. Like he knew all your secrets and weaknesses. There was another really uneasy situation when I nearly shat my pants. Of course, it was during the night shift. Of course, our office was separated from the part of the building where the patients lived and the only way out of the patient's area was through our office, which was highly secured with automatic locks and cameras. Two of my colleagues made their rounds to look after the patients. I stayed in the office and watched the surveillance cameras, and suddenly I got an unsettling feeling. I looked out of the window, and in the reflection I saw a young woman hiding behind the door, watching me, smiling. I instantly jumped up out of my chair and pressed the alarm button on my pager. Even though the woman was one of the chilled patients, after we brought her back into her room, we tried to reconstruct how she might have got out. But on the cameras, we saw nothing that could have explained it. Unfortunately, it was during one of my last days there, so I never did find out what exactly happened there. But it was super creepy. I was a surgery nurse for five years. I have several stories that people love to have me tell. Here's what I think is the grossest one. I had a roughly 65 year old woman who had just had a fempop bypass surgery. So she had a femoral artery incision in her groin. This is a fairly common procedure to care for on my floor, so I've become accustomed to my CNAs knowing what the aftercare should be, which is lay flat for an hour, no straining, pressure, dressing on the incision, etc. But this day, we had a float from another floor who didn't know. After doing my incision checks and assessment, the aide came to help clean the patient up, as she had sweated a ton in recovery. During the bed bath, the aide apparently removed what looked to be an extra bit of tape, but was actually helping to hold the pressure dressing in place. If that had been it, we may have been okay. But then the patient told the aide that she hadn't had a bowel movement in several days, so the aide put her on a bedpan to try. Several minutes later, the patient's roommate hits her call button because my patient was making a weird whimpering noise. I go in to find my patient white as a ghost and only semi-conscious. I immediately yell for help and pull the sheets back to check her incision, only to find blood all over the bed and her groin. The aide comes in to take her off the bedpan and freaks out. As I'm holding pressure on her incision, as an attempt to stop the bleeding, the aide pulls the bedpan out, and floating in a pool of rapidly clotting blood is a nice big turd. 
I rode her bed all the way to the OR holding pressure. She had to have emergency surgery and six units of blood, but happily she made it. And I definitely learnt the importance of talking to your CNAs. This has been my one and only true paranormal experience to date. I have had a few encounters with seeing shadow people, but this is one that truly terrified me. One summer evening, I had stayed up late to watch Headbangers Ball on MTV with my older sister. I was a big fan of death metal as a kid, and this was summer 2005. I got up to go to bed, and as I passed, our front door to get to the room, I see this Native American man standing there. I will never forget, he was about six foot three, six foot five, and he had a black suit and one of those old timey top hats. He had long looking hair and these piercing blue eyes. I froze in fear for a moment and then began to scream loudly. My sister jumped up and saw him as well through a nearby salt shaker and then chucked it at him. And this is where the part that got me really freaked me out. His face contorted into this incredibly sad expression as he got turned around and faced expulsion through the front door. A few days later, I was telling the story to my dad who was like an out of states army person and he asked me how to explain. I told him it's not much more than last time. But anyway, afterwards, he said my description sounded like his great uncle who had died when my father was small. I think about it sometimes. In my final year of college, I lived alone in an apartment. I loved it, until I started dealing with something weird. There were whispers in my ear when I'd go to sleep at night, which I always just chalked up to thinking. But then it became weirder. I thought I saw someone in my kitchen area when I was in the shower. The bathroom door didn't have a vent, so I left the door open when I showered. Whenever I'd go to shave my legs, I'd prop one on the back of the tub, only to feel like someone was staring at me from where the toilet was. It was a very deep unsettling feeling, and again, I chalked this up to my weird self weirding me out, even though this happened all the time. But what confirmed it for me, was one night when something got thrown across my kitchen. A few minutes later, I had turned my lights out to go to bed, and in the morning, I found my beach stone had been sitting on the table on the other side of the apartment, and it was right next to the front kitchen door. The apartment was in a building that used to be a house which was converted into apartments. It was a super deal building, and had a lot of quirks to it. My apartment used to be the attic which was later converted to a top floor apartment. My boyfriend and I went camping a couple of summers ago, and I gashed my knee while swimming in a river. It hurt and it bled, but we washed it off and wrapped it up and finished off the camping trip. We came back home and I pretty much ignored my injury because it didn't look too bad and it hadn't been bothering me. I didn't bandage it or anything. And over the next few days, it flared up again, definitely got infected and swelled up very noticeably. For whatever reason, I still didn't give it attention. And by the end of the week, my injured knee was twice the size of my okay knee. The sight of the cut was pushing out cottage cheesy yellow goop every time I bent my leg. And it hurt so bad, I ended up just trying an ice pack to my leg for the day. I thought I was pretty badass, 
for having this crazy infection. And I discovered that the cut had gotten so deeply infected that it had not yet healed from the inside. And to my fascination, I could stick my bacteria riddled index finger into the wound and it would sink in all the way up to my first knuckle. Yes, that first knuckle. The wound would make a pop sound every time the skin broke opened up and closed when I moved my knee. And it looked like puckered lips drooling out yogurt streaked with blood. I finally decided it was time to see a professional when one, I caught a peek at my bone one day, two, my knee decided to lock in place from the swelling, and three, I developed a wicked fever. Oh, and I also forgot to mention, I was born prematurely, so I have no sense of smell. One day, my mom knocked on the door of my bedroom, and insisted that something was up because she could smell my knee from the hallway. Turned out, it was a staph infection, and if I hadn't have treated it a moment sooner, the infection would have spread to my heart, or I would have needed my leg amputated. I don't know what was wrong with me that summer. I definitely have good hygiene, and I know how to take care of myself. I am an ERRN. This, so far, is the only death I've experienced from work that I've lost a significant amount of sleep over. 24 year old male walks, again, walks into the ER with complaints of flu-like symptoms for the past three days. He had decided to come in that day because he started to develop a rash throughout his body that he was unfamiliar with. Sadly, the rash was actually the result of a failed battle with bacterial meningitis, causing him to bleed internally and externally. By the time we got him back to the ER, he started crying blood, and the terror in his eyes was palpable. He went downhill fast. His lucidity diminished with his blood pressure, and the last thing he said before succumbing to pulseless VTAC was something about his mother that we could not make out. You could see his consciousness fade from his eyes as we started compressions. The code lasted close to an hour. At first, we could still keep his oxygen levels up with mechanical ventilation, defibrillation, and drugs. But blood was filling in his airways faster than it could be suctioned out. He was bleeding too fast for any medication or fluids to keep his body pressure up. He died, soaked in blood, and nearly unrecognisable, due to his now almost uniformly purple skin and swollen face. We found out later that he was studying neurobiology. He had a devoted girlfriend that was, for all intents and purposes, a fiancé, a large family, and many friends. He was an athlete who lived healthy, had beautiful curly hair, and this made the death tragic in a way that you don't experience when an 80 year old dies. It made the unanswered pleas to God for help that had been sent echoing around the room by his family all the more bitter. I helped drag and push him into a body bag. My uncle lives out deep in rural Oregon. He told me the story where he was driving to work really early in the morning, to a small town about 30 minutes away. There was a bit of traffic just outside of town, so he stopped beside another car. There was a super heavy fog this morning, like Silent Hill quality, really thick so he could just see the backlights of the car in front of him. After following the car very slowly, for a while, the car stops once more in traffic. My uncle sits there and waits for about 20 minutes. The car hasn't moved. All he can see is the headlights in front of him. Eventually, he gets out to see what's the matter. 
When my uncle gets out and walks to the car in front of him, he sees the entire front of the car completely totaled. Inside, the driver was dead. The back part of the car was completely fine, and my uncle did not know a thing was wrong earlier due to the fog. The story always unsettled me when I had to drive in fog. I sleepwalk and sleep talk a lot. I've said and done a lot of wacky things while I'm asleep, and I've also done some creepy things. One thing I do a lot in my sleep is get up and go somewhere else. The night in question, I had done this, but instead of going onto the couch or the chair or floor or something, I went to the couch, all the way down in my basement. My basement has a lock on it that can only be accessed from the outside of it. When I woke up. After realizing I had probably sleepwalked downstairs, I walk up the stairs to leave the basement. But the odd thing was, it was locked. If I walked downstairs to go to sleep, unlocking the door to do so, then how could the door be locked? I was the only one home that day, and lived somewhere very rural and isolated. So there was no one about who could have locked the door. The time was two a.m., which is even more odd, because I never wake up in the middle of the night. I climbed out of a window in my basement and went back into my house and checked to see if the door was still locked. It was. Nowadays, this freaks me the hell out, but at that point, I was asleep. So I was like, "Okay," and went back to sleep elsewhere. So me and my best friend, including three others, were hanging out in this field about midnight to one in the morning. You could only access this field with an off-roading vehicle. Our three other friends wandered off, and I should mention only one of them is a girl. So me and my best friend were walking by ourselves, and we come across this girl, wearing a white T-shirt, with her back to us. We thought it was our friend, since there were no other cars up there, so we call her name. She didn't move. We got closer and called again, and we were about five feet behind her, and called again. She didn't move again. We freaked out. And headed back to the car, and found the girl who we thought it was, and she wasn't wearing a white T-shirt. We thought it was a prank at first, but we realized it couldn't have been her for many reasons. We still don't know who or what she was. The scariest part is that she was near some government building or something. No one knows what it is, because on Google Earth it's surrounded by trees. My best friend. Tried to go there, and some guys in a car drove up, and told him not to come back, or he would be shot. I am a psychology student. This is a story from one of my most favourite abnormal psych professors. My professor was working with a patient, doing some job counselling. We will call the patient Julie. Julie is a 23-year-old woman who lives with her mother, stepfather, and her five children. She is having trouble keeping a job, and she has recently been fired from her job at a call center for falling asleep on the job, and for lashing out and assaulting her manager. She has been fired from eight out of twelve jobs, and she is studying to become a CNA. And has had multiple warnings for falling asleep in class. Four out of her five children are in the custody of her mother, due to a personal and family history of drug abuse, drug trafficking, and check fraud. Julie has her own probation officer, and two of her children have probation officers for fighting at school, as one almost killed 
another kid by strangling him. There is constant fighting in the home between Julie and her mother, but they do not argue when the stepfather is around. Julie's mother denies any sexual abuse occurred when Julie was a child, but Julie remembers otherwise. It came out later in therapy that Julie was never taught how to tell the time. The reason she was so tired was because she was staying up all night watching television so that the correct television time slot would prompt her to wake her kids up for school and for her to go to work. In addition, my professor found out later that all five of Julie's children were born from an incestuous relationship with her own stepfather, who had been sexually abusing her since she was a small girl. She was also staying up all night to protect her children from her stepfather. But, as a good twist, Julie got the right diagnosis for borderline personality disorder. She continued therapy in school and got back custody of all five of her children. She is now happily married to a woman and is an artist. So, no, it's not the scariest story, but I'll never forget it. We had several other cases to analyze during the class, but this one about Julie will stay with me forever. I can't get over the fact that no one ever taught her how to tell the time. I used to work at an animal shelter and I would stay pretty late sometimes. I used to hate staying late because something weird would always happen. Once at around 7 p.m. I was just finishing up and it was pitch black outside. I was already a little on edge as the animals were making all sorts of weird noises and knocking things over in their rooms. I had to head to the front of the building. It's one big open room to turn out the lights and head out the back door to lock up. I get to the lights and start heading back to my desk. I drop my time card on my desk and take off. As I'm about halfway to the back door, I hear my card fall to the floor and clatter about. There's no way it could have moved as it was flat on my desk. I thought for half a second that I should check it out and then wisely decided against it. You better believe it that I booked it out of there immediately. Even weirder still, I was relaying this story to a co-worker a few days after, late at night again. I'm also telling her I've heard crystal clear little kid laughter before too. Right after I finish that, the motion sensor handheld dispenser goes off in the bathroom down the hall. I obviously book it out of there, but my co-worker didn't seem too creeped out. That place is weird at night. <laughs> The home I grew up in was in Long Island, New York. And the basement is lined on one side with small windows, probably about three foot by one foot, rectangular, with sliding glass planes on them. The house was built during the Second World War, so it is made of what they had at the time. Normally, we would have curtains on the inside of those windows, so nothing could see or come in. This particular day, my mother had been washing them and hadn't put them back up yet. I was around eight or nine years old, sitting there playing Mario 3 on my NES, when I get the distinct feeling that I was being watched by someone. I look over my shoulder to the window and see the outline of someone's face. Once they notice me looking at them, they knock on the window really loudly, vigorously wave at me, and then bolt off, 
hopping over the neighbor's fence into the adjacent yard. Needless to say, I was left on the Nez and noped my way out of there as fast as possible. The next day, the Nez was moved up, and the very next day, the Nez was moved upstairs to the family room, and I still check to make sure the curtains are on when I am down in that basement. This happened eight years ago, when I was a sophomore in high school. My urban exploration friends and I went on a bike ride looking for cool places to explore in a relatively dilapidated area, when we discovered a really creepy cave which turned out to be an old abandoned cement mine. We did some mild exploring that first day, but quickly realised it would require more gear to go through to explore, including flashlights and respirators. About a week later, the five of us came back with the proper gear and a camera to see what we could find in the mine. We discovered there was basically one main shaft that sloped downwards and deeper into the earth. So we followed that main route. It was wide enough for a car to drive down and was pretty well graded, so the walking was easy. There were many rooms, old machinery and rusting equipment off this main shaft. But we mostly avoided it in the beginning. We were trying not to get lost or confused. Along the way, the walls were littered with the classic abandoned graffiti. Simon was here. Schwashtickers, initials, dates, the typical phallic drawings, and more. As we got deeper and deeper though, the graffiti really thinned out. At this point, the light from the entrance was long gone and we were relying solely on flashlights. The air was so stagnant and hazy, with particles that the light from our flimsy flashlights would only go 20 feet or so before getting totally obscured by dust. Thank goodness for the respirators. The glow sticks we had bought to mark our way to prevent getting lost were also basically useless because they would disappear into the haze only a few steps after dropping them, and we had only bought about ten or so. At this point, we started arguing amongst ourselves. Several of the crew were nervous about going any deeper, with the air quality becoming so terrible, and without a good way to prevent us from getting lost. We were probably a quarter of a mile into the earth now, and the rest of us managed to override that sentiment of fear by assuring them that the path was easy and straightforward. So we would have to try to get lost. We were going to rely on our level headedness, sense of direction and flashlight battery to get out. Despite the agreement to push on, it was becoming very creepy for everyone. We walked for a while in silence, hearing nothing but our own movements and the steady drip of water coming from somewhere deep within the cave. I think we were all pretty scared at this point, but no longer willing to admit it to each other. Then we stumbled across something that made us stop cold. Dug into the side of the deep stone shaft we were slowly descending was a tunnel, an offshoot. It was narrow. You'd have to crouch to go through it. It was also a good few feet off the ground, so required a scramble to reach it. But that wasn't what made us stop. It was the graffiti. We hadn't seen any for about ten minutes or so, so we had assumed that the artists never came this far. But someone else clearly had a message. 
and they left it very ominously. The tunnel was lined with words written in white, all of them somehow reflecting to death and destruction. Scrawled through the tunnel were words like suffering, pain, plague, disease, and hell. It was pretty terrifying. Who else would come this far just to write such a terrible message in a mysterious tunnel that broke from the main path? But there was no turning back now. We had to see where the tunnel led to. Despite our fear, we were overpowered by intense curiosity. So one by one, we crawled through the tunnel to see the other side. What we found was a strange flooded chamber. Around a pool of water, there were many large stones each covered with dozens of burnt-out tea candles. There must have been hundreds of used tea candles in the place. The walls had a few creepy monster faces poorly graffitied on them, and the tunnel entrance, back to the main shaft, was ringed and spray-painted with a blood-stained mouth. What is this place? Some weird ritual site for local Satan worshippers? An elaborate hoax set out by some kids? Or just some creative artwork? We couldn't find much evidence to figure out what it was, and we were running out of adrenaline to keep exploring. We all crawled out of there, and made our way back to the main shaft, where we promptly headed towards the exit. When we finally saw that pinprick of natural light, coming from the real world outside, we were flooded with relief. We never did figure out what the mysterious cavern was for, and I think I'm content to leave it a mystery. No, we didn't hear any monsters in the depths of the tunnel, or find any Satan worshippers covered in blood. But, just finding that room, buried deep in an old forgotten mine, was enough to creep the hell out of us for a very long time. I worked as a hospital chaplain this summer. We got called to every code blue, in order to be with the family and or pray while the staff worked on the patient. At 3.30am, I get paged to the cardiac ICU. A 30-year-old woman has coded and they are working hard to get her back. She is flat on her back while they are doing compressions, and she's not conscious. No family present, so I am working hard to stay out of the way and pray silently. When all of a sudden, this woman sits up straight in bed and full on screams, Let me go! Everyone just stops and stares at her. Finally, after a pause that felt like forever, Someone says, not today, and everyone kind of starts chuckling and breaks what felt like a very tense room. The staff quickly go back to work, trying to stabilize her, much of which she actually refused for the first minute or so. After she was stabilized a little more, I returned to the call room and continued with my night. But months later, thinking about her and that scream, I still wonder what she may have seen, and why she wanted to go so badly. Her scream has been imprinted on my heart, and still gives me chills. I am a female, of age 24, and I live with my sister at the first floor of a three-floor building, with a big garden surrounded by a fence and gate. The two other families in my building are cool but the neighbours are honestly the worst people I have ever met. The landlord has already told the neighbours not to let their kids play ball and jump over the fence to pick up the ball in our garden. They've destroyed flowers, fruit and the fence. And the parents don't care because they say that they're just kids and won't pay for the destroyed fence. Lately, my sister caught one of the kids 
peeping through our bathroom window. Fortunately, he couldn't see much because of the curtains inside, but he tried. We tried to talk to the neighbors, but oh surprise, they said they didn't understand that they only speak Turkish. How convenient. Anyway, I caught the teenage kid staring through the window the second time, and I called the police. They took 40 minutes to come, and they didn't seem to want to help. They said, without damages on your property, or if he didn't try to force entry, there's nothing we can do. My landlord said she'd already called the cops before, but they didn't care either. My sister and I also noticed some socks and tank tops of ours were disappearing magically from our clothesline outside. My boyfriend gave me a collapsible baton, two folding knives and two pepper sprays, and we never leave home without them. It's annoying that nothing can be done about the situation. We're planning to move out. But why should we? Parents won't educate their kids and the police won't help you. Something has to be done, but I'm not sure what. There is this abandoned mental hospital in my town called Prudho Hospital, near Newcastle in the United Kingdom, which is sort of the scary place kids go to show bravado. It's surrounded by woods, so obviously you hear a lot about it. You hear lots of stories from people after it was abandoned, but the spookiest things come from when it was still in service. My mum worked as an auxiliary nurse there for years and she said at night the crippled kids who couldn't move due to severe disease and birth defects would somehow get out of their cribs and into the middle of the floor on the walls whatever was doing this would also go around and remove blankets from all the patients and again pile them in the center of the room eventually security was hired believing it was someone getting into the hospital at night and doing these things to scare people or just to cause trouble. However, even with security, they never found out who was doing these things late at night. This is only one of the hundreds of stories I've heard. It's quite spooky and seems like whoever you talk to has a different story. I used to be a security supervisor at a hospital with an abandoned old hospital on site. We had to do walkthroughs and I worked the graveyard shift. The place was creepy cool. I felt a bit like an urban explorer, but creepy nonetheless. It was like something out of 28 days later. Some lights worked, others didn't. Others still just flickered. So I'd be walking down a hallway, with some pitch black rooms on either side, in a section where the hallway lights were out, and the next section, the hallway lights were flickering. I always felt like a hobo could be chilling in a room and have me at the disadvantage, as I'm loud, with keys, a flashlight and a radio, and I always felt uneasy. On this one occasion, I showed up at midnight and saw the whole top floor of the hospital had every working light turned on. The split shift supervisor told me that he had called the maintenance guy as they were the only other people with keys and they hadn't been up there. He said it happened around 11 and he was putting it off for me to handle. Place stood out like a beacon across the whole hospital grounds. So I grabbed one of my guys and went up, and we walked together and turned it all back off. We didn't find a soul, but they could have duked us or swapped to a different floor. Only part of the abandoned hospital that's still in use is the psych ward. One time, the nurse is called complaining about people moving furniture above them, on the abandoned floor. So I went up and found the place a mess, but I didn't see anyone. We went down to tell them, 
and they saw up and down that it was loud and there was a lot of noise. One time, I was walking through the old ICU. No lights in the whole place, except one side hallway, and it flickered. So I'm walking up, uneasy as usual, and I'm walking past the side hall, and the lights flick on. To my left is a bloody man in a chair, and I damn near shat myself. Lights flipped off, and then when it came back on, I saw it was a mannequin, or CPR dummy I think, covered in some red paint, that was propped up on the chair. Turns out, some cops asked to see the haunted hospital, the shift before, and thought it would be funny to set that damned thing up there for me. Lots of other incidents like guards reporting hearing babies cry, when there were none. Doors opening independently. Swiveling chairs start swiveling by themselves. It didn't happen to me personally. But we did like to mess with them when they were up there and yell into the mic every now and again. Makes you jump when you're quietly going through that hauntingly empty place. My mother works in a hospital. So I've heard enough horror stories. One that sticks out was when a guy was brought into the ER after being mugged. My mum was supporting his head and neck while he was being moved, and when she let go, her gloved hands were apparently covered in his blood and parts of his brain. Apparently the mugger had hit him so hard in the back of the head with a brick, that his head had literally broken. She told me about it when she got home from her shift. I've never seen her look so traumatised. Another incident. The hospital where she works also treats inmates from the prison nearby. When they come into hospital, they're obviously handcuffed to the gurney, resulting in them being convinced that they're either being killed by lethal injection, despite the fact that the UK doesn't have the death penalty, or are being prepared to be experimented on by the government. Once, for some stupid reason, a prisoner was in a room with only a trainee, operating department practitioner, who was keeping an eye on them. Said prisoner was heavily sedated, but he started to come to, then freaked out and ripped out his IV, resulting in blood being sprayed all over the room. The trainee panicked, ran around the room screaming, and my mom and two others ran into the room to restrain the prisoner and throw the hysterical trainee out, all while slipping on the blood that covered the floor. When my mom told me about the prisoner, I was nearly laughing at the comedy skit-esque setting. She said that she'd never been so close to slapping a trainee before, and telling them to sort their shit out. A lone abandoned farmhouse in North East Iceland, Langanis. That's the place. This was a real edge of the earth kind of business. It was a few hundred metres from the Arctic Ocean, about 10 kilometres from the nearest sealed road, and not a single soul for miles. I was on my own, and just heading up for a quick explore. I was on field work up there for other reasons. I went inside. It wasn't too messed up, not much furniture, some things left in the kitchen, with the homemade poster saying, A Up to Mott, 1982. A festival that celebrates the bringing of sheep before the winter. So it was abandoned at some point after that. I was about to explore the top floor, when I heard a creak. I stopped and listened, for a few seconds. There was nothing else. Fine. 
I went up two or three more steps and heard the creak again, then genuinely two or three more footsteps, or at least the sound of it. This really got the hairs on my neck up. Now logically, I knew there was essentially zero chance of anyone else being there. As I mentioned before, this is the definition of isolated, in the absolute middle of nowhere. And if you know Iceland, you know that there aren't a lot of people. And I enjoy thinking of myself as a reasonable, not easily spooked man. I went up one more step, then heard two more footsteps, and something slam onto the floor above, and I legged it. I ran back down the stairs out of the farmhouse, back into my Land Rover, and headed off down the track. I never did find out what it was, and I felt stupid, but my love of horror movies took control of my brain, and told me to run from the footsteps in the attic of an abandoned farmhouse. At least, I got a few good photos. When I was a little dude, probably four or five, my little sister, who was one year younger than I, shared a bedroom. Our bedroom door looked over the living room wall, and behind that area was our playroom. The playroom was a level lower and had huge ceilings. So the living room was roughly six to eight feet above the playroom. One night, I woke up and saw a dark, blue hooded figure holding what looked like a candle coming through the wall. It looked towards our bedroom and then continued to float into the living room. I was so little I just hid under my blankets. A few years later, when we lived in a different house, I was telling my mum the story about the blue thing that I saw when I was in the old house. My sister was doing homework at the table and her ears perked up before I finished my story and said, Did it have a candle? Yeah. Did it come through the living room wall? Yeah. Did it look into the bedroom? Uh, yeah, actually. Then my mum says, Uh, it didn't have a hood by any chance, did it? Yeah. What the hell was it? My mum says, I don't know. Your father used to tell me that he saw the blue cloaked guy with a hood and a candle hanging out by the barn rafters at night. I always assumed he was drunk or high, but I never believed him until now. I can still picture that thing so vividly. My sister and I are in our early 30s, but we still talk about it on occasion. My dad was in a cult. So was my mother, but hers was a lot tamer and less interesting. Since I spent weekends with my dad for a couple of years, I was in the cult as well, at least as far as they was concerned. So let's discuss this cult's behaviour. Women were allowed to be ministers, but not allowed to wear pants. Going swimming with these people was the funniest goddamn thing I've ever seen, because they swam fully clothed. They didn't ever wear shorts. They believed that they could speak a secret ancient language by being possessed by either God or the Holy Spirit. It was kind of unclear which. In reality, they sounded like someone was trying to speak Hebrew with a racist accent. They didn't believe in doctors, and they once tried to heal one of my cluster headaches by putting oil on my head and babbling in tongues. All the kids were homeschooled and the parents constantly tried to set their children up with each other, with the expectation being that they'd marry within the faith. There weren't that many followers. Higher education was just not a consideration. All these people were either factory workers or stay-at-home mums. The worst part, though, is that they were all super nice people. They were all good to each other, and they would all give you the shirt off their backs but they were ruining their kids' lives. Last I heard of it, they all just sort of fell apart and people moved away. My dad moved with his second wife to another state, and I haven't really seen anyone from that church since. My biggest hope 
is that those kids were okay. Because I think some of them got really messed up. I was the night watchman at an abandoned mental hospital turned state park for a summer in college. The only creepy thing I remember was one night I was with one of the state park police and we saw flashlights in one of the buildings. Kids constantly broke in and other people broke in to gut the old buildings of any copper they could find. So as I was saying one night, we saw flashlights moving around, so we went in. The officer pulled her gun and flashlight, and in we went. We could hear footsteps on the floor above us, so we slowly and quietly went upstairs. We checked every room and found nothing, and with there being virtually no places to hide, we found this very strange until we heard footsteps above us again. This happened for a few floors, until we were on the very top floor below the roof, and we heard footsteps up on the roof. So we went up there. Still nothing. We never found anyone or any indication that anyone had been there. It was friggin creepy. There was another night that was extra spooky. I was driving along one of the trails through the woods with one of my friends. There are no lights on the trail, only light source was my headlight. About 20 or 30 yards down the road, I saw a big branch down. I slowed down to drive around it, and my friend screams, Holy shit! That tree branch just looked at me! I jammed my brakes, and we both jumped out, as someone took off into the trees. It was a dude, full camo, from head to toe. I had a patient who was older than dirt, riddled with cancer, and was in the hospital for a DVT. He died between rounds, but we had to code him anyway. As I was pumping on his chest, while everyone else was moving his roommate out, and bringing the crash cart, he started vomiting this disgusting, thick, brown, red crap. Every time I thrust, more would come out. I am trying to do effective compressions while holding his head to the side to prevent, or rather, at least, reduce aspiration. We coded for more than an hour, and he never stopped being dead. And then, I had to stay like an extra two hours to finish the work I didn't get done. Oh, and there was also the incident of the dude who had his toe amputated, and then we saw him back a month later. He hadn't changed the bandages at all, and his wound had got maggots in it. Apparently, his daughter came to his house to take him out for Father's Day. She helped him dress, saw the maggots, went out to eat anyway, then brought him to the ER. The ER opened the bandage and went, hey look, maggots, and replaced it, then sent him to the floor. Day shift nurses looked and went, oh my god maggots, and left it for us. I had to take photos for wound care documentation, and then we drowned the maggots and finally put a clean bandage on. He ended up having to get an above-the-knee amputation, but at least the maggots reduced the infection enough to save his life. A few years back, when I was a medical student, I was doing my primary care rotation when I had to see a morbidly obese lady for a gynecological issue. She said she was having a lot of itching and soreness in her vagina. Even as I set up for a pelvic examination, I could already tell it wasn't going to be good. I could smell a foul odour already, and I hadn't even looked. I was gloving up when I got so nauseated that I was about to get sick. So I excused myself and lied to my attending that I had a problem 
taking a look because she was so obese and I didn't have much experience with such a challenge. The truth was, I just couldn't stay in the room. It smelled like rotting vagina. A few minutes later, my attending called in order to show me what he has found. I thought for sure it would be an aborted fetus, but I was wrong. I go in with my mask, and there, my attending dangles this cylindrical object covered with bloody debris. It was a tampon. She apparently had difficulty removing it a week ago, and my attending kept saying, it stinks like a mag. The embarrassed patient was crying, and I felt bad, but I had to step out of the room because I was beginning to regurgitate my saliva and was on the verge of puking. To this day, I can't forget that smell. I think that was my deciding factor as far as not going into OB slash GYN. I just don't want to encounter that horrific smell ever again. So this happened while I was living at home. I hear a glass breaking in the middle of the night. I think someone is trying to break in or something. So I call my grandpa as he lives downstairs, since my mum was away from the weekend. I wake him up and start searching upstairs while he searches downstairs with not a single piece of broken glass to be found. I shrug it off and forget about it. A month later, my mum bursts into my room in the middle of the night, whispering and yelling about hearing broken glass and thinking someone is breaking in. I sleepily tell her that it's nothing, and I heard it a few months ago as well. She decides to go downstairs and check it out just to be sure. On our wooden mantle above the fireplace, we keep a religious candle. This one, I believe, was the sacred heart of Jesus burning all the time. We've had it for the past 21 years, and I think even before that. Nothing like this had ever happened. My mum walks downstairs to see if half of the candle glass had been shattered. The liquid wax poured out into a river and somehow the flames travelled down the liquid wax and lit a little corner of our wooden mantelpiece on fire. I have never seen glass break happen like that, and I've seen a lot of glassware break in my time, in labs and in chemical engineering student life for many different pressures, temperatures and stress factors, and I have never been more scared in my entire life. My father went with a group to go on a trip to Tanzania to do some medical work in a poor village. For a few nights of the trip, the group stayed in a hotel. My dad was sharing a room with another man from the group with separate beds. One night, he is woken up by his roommate who had the light on. He looks terrified trembling and praying. My dad asks what's wrong, but he wouldn't say anything about it. My dad is obviously concerned, but since he couldn't do anything about it, he went back to sleep. The next night in the middle of the night, my father gets up to pee. He walks to the bathroom and starts to relieve himself when he catches a very strong scent of body odor. He and most of the people from the group a daily deodorant wearers being from the US, but many locals in Tanzania don't wear it as frequently. So when the smell hits his nose, he realizes that him and his roommate may not be alone. He turns around and sees standing there in the doorway, a local woman, shaking violently, her eyes rolled up looking on the ceiling. He panics as no one should have been able to get into the room. He turns back around towards the bathroom in a moment of confusion. But then when he turns back, she's gone. As if she'd never been there to begin with. 
thoroughly shaken. He goes back to bed, thinking that maybe he was dreaming or seeing things. He lays back down on his side. This story happened to a girl who attended my high school and was two years my junior. Our story begins as Daphne was going to bed one night during a Charlotte winter, which can get unpleasantly cold. Daphne tells that she remembers being restless during her sleep, and that she remembers groggily waking up and pulling her covers up, which had gotten displaced several times throughout the night. At one point, Daphne wakes up, shivering as once again her blanket had been yet again manoeuvred away. Without moving or opening her eyes, Daphne lays in silence, wondering why she would keep kicking her blanket off in her sleep, when she felt her blanket being pulled towards the foot of her bed. Terrified, Daphne opens her eyes to a man staring at her intently while pulling away the covers. Immediately, Daphne jumps up, screams, and runs out of the room to her parents. The man escaped through the window and was never found. The police were called and discovered beer cans and a knife under her bed, giving them a reason to believe the man would frequently watch her at night. No one knows if the man was planning on raping her, or merely liked watching her in her sleep, or was having himself a nice wank while he watched her. In the 90s, I worked overnight and weekend security at a center for psychiatry that cared for inpatients, outpatients, and even the criminally insane awaiting trial. That area of the building was basically a prison instead of a hospital. People would often bring in the arrested for evaluation, and the homeless could even walk in and ask for help. We saw all kinds. I did this job for years, and some nights got very, very busy. Two scary situations really stick out from those times. The first, I was manning the front desk, and a walking patient holding a knife walks in, screaming, that he wants to kill himself. He had cut himself all over his body and was covered in blood. My supervisor quickly rifled through the database and found him. He had a history of violence against staff, AIDS, hepatitis and more. I was commanded to put him down and I approached him with a chair as a shield. When he wound up to swing the knife at me, I rammed him with the chair until he went down. Then a bunch of staff jumped in and everybody put one foot down on him until he was better subdued and eventually sedated. A doctor was in my face right after yelling, Did he touch you? Did he cut you? I still wasn't sure until after an examination. The second incident started when two police brought in a tough looking guy for an assessment. This guy is keeping his head down not saying anything, and I led them into a secure observation room. The arrested and one officer goes in. The other cop returns with me to get our information and to see if he's in our database. Suddenly my partner, who was watching the monitors, jumps up and hits the alarm and run backs the way we came in. We run after, and the door is wide open, and we see the guy wailing on the officer with his handcuffs, like a one-handed flail. The other cop does most of the work in this case, and the arrest is pretty much laid out on the floor. How did this happen? How did this happen? In my quick inspection, I notice that his hands are funny. They're all covered in blood from the fight, but something doesn't look right. I look closer. The guy doesn't have a thumb. Even the ball socket that attaches the thumb to the palm has been removed. The cop looks at the other hand. Holy shit, both thumbs removed. They cuffed the guy 
and didn't notice he was missing both thumbs. The cuffs would just slide off. Still thinking about that guy. How? Why? For what reason? What crazy world was he a part of where something like that could even happen? I still wonder. My great grandpa was a lazy, mean, rude jackass who didn't care about anyone but himself. He would go to work, come home, expect dinner to be laid on the table, and then go to bed every day. And he was always nasty to my great grandma. My great grandma kept complaining that he never fixed any of the various problems around the house. The stove wasn't working right. Some parts of the house were practically falling apart and there were leaks in the roof and holes in the floor. It was a mess. Of course, he would just yell at her and tell her that it wasn't his problem. Well, one day, he ends up dying. And even though he was still a giant jackass, my great grandma still loved him and she felt miserable over his death. So, a few days after his funeral, her friend decided to take her out and spend the day away from the house to try and take her mind off it. She comes back a few hours later and the door is unlocked. She thinks someone's broken in, so she panics and rushes around the house. Then she notices something. The roof is fixed, the floor is fixed, and the stove is fixed. Everything that she complained to her husband about was repaired. She then went back to the front door and noticed that his favourite shoes were sitting in front of the door and his favourite coat was sitting on the coat rack next to the door. The door was open and while she could still see out the door, the door closed all on its own. I met a sociopath. A sociopath who beautifully played the role of an ordinary normal human being. It took me quite some time to realise he was playing a role. A role that he had been rehearsing for years. Giving his grand performance on a day-to-day -day basis. It took me even longer to realise that I was playing the part of the leading lady. But... So were dozens of other women. We all were. We were all understudies for one another. And we didn't even know it. All feeding into the same twisted fantasy that felt all too real. This story begins for me as a hopeful 19-year-old girl in the midst of pursuing an education in creative writing. Prior to my first English class at university, I looked my prospective professors up on the internet. You know, those quirky rate my professor sites that we're all fed into. The comment section floored me as soon as I entered his name, as I was met with reviews of what an attractive and wonderful human being he was. As you can imagine, I sat patiently in the back of the room on the first day of class. I expected a Brad Pitt look-alike to appear. So when I was met with a pudgy, balding man in his late thirties, my mind whirled as I looked at my friend to my left and shrugged, feeling silly for bragging about how attractive this man was going to be. He entered class ten minutes late with a wide smirk on his face. His hair in uncombed wisps that desperately tried to cover the evidence of premature aging. His face was swollen looking with beady green eyes that sunk into his head, darting back at the wall and the tile ceiling. He had the physique of a man that spent most of his afternoons sitting at a desk throwing back beers, stains on his car keys and buttons missing on his blazer, and his faded white collar shirt was wrinkled 
and tucked into his pants in a haphazardous way. He was meticulously lazy. He wanted you to know that he didn't care. Every move calculated in such a way that you believed what he wanted you to believe. Looks aside, this man was a comedic genius, a real savant with words. He spent half of the class telling ridiculous stories, chock full of cuss words and euphemisms. His personality made up for the rest of him, in a big way of course. It is later to be revealed that this personality was an act of work of a twisted, deluded art. Our first writing assignment was a personal essay. I chose to write a highly descriptive narrative depicting what it would be like to fight a female MMA fighter. It was less than two pages long, and most of it was just spent describing what hot asphalt felt like on human hands while doing push-up in the middle of July. I can tell you this because the response that followed my submission of this essay would make you think that I wrote a how-to manual on how to give blowjobs. After our first writing assignment, and a few weeks later, I sent him an email asking him if he knew how I could become more involved with creative writing on campus. I mean, that is what the professors are there for, right? They are there to help you achieve what you want to pursue in life. I was directed to seek out whoever is involved with the school paper and see if I could be of any service. I politely thanked him and then was met with this response. This is from John Carrigan. I like the way you write. There's an intimacy and energy and vibrancy about it. A closeness of detail and imagery that generates real emotion. Now for me, this literally came out of nowhere. And the basis of how I am a writer was only portrayed through my personal essay on boxing and octagon rings. But let me tell you, I ate this shit up. You see, as a young female writer who wants nothing more than to be an accomplished published author, this is exactly what we want to hear. I thanked him and virtually blushed. He replied, It helps that I know you in person, but I feel like your writing matches your persona, and that's an important ability for any writer. I mean, it's no secret that you are an absurdly beautiful girl and you have a kind of persuasion and quiet comfort and confidence about you. I noticed those things about you quite intuitively, and I can feel them translated onto your page that kind of eases into your own skin and sensuality. I replied, I really, really appreciate that. You have no idea how much it means to me. I would love to be a writer someday. So all that you have to offer in terms of advice really helps. Then the teacher replied, You deserve it. I'm going to assume that you know that you are quite gorgeous, because, well, how couldn't you? But you show an ability to grant that beauty and sensuality in a kind of artistic vibe and spirit. It becomes something as opposed to just being something that you look at in a static way. Sometimes beauty is just about being sexually desirable, but that grows boring after a time. Yours is a kind of attractive creative idea and identity, if that makes sense. You don't shy away from your sex appeal in your writing, nor do you commercialize it in the easy way. You translate it into a kind of closeness and intensity of imagery and experience that you're privy to. And know that you never have to feel appreciated. You are smart, talented, sweet, unique, creative, and beautiful. It is not exactly a chore to be around you, you know. Just so that you know, this professor had me in class for less than three weeks at this point. I replied, I'm completely flattered. Could I give you some of my writing samples to proofread and give me feedback on them? 
the teacher replied, "Of course, you help me just as much having people like you in my life. It is what makes everything worthwhile. The things that give you energy to think and create and feel, and leave your whole soul out there. Beautiful, insightful, talented, and passionate. You are unique, and that is never lost on me." I thanked him again, and was really blushing. And I said it was a pleasure to have someone like him as a professor. He replied for one last time, "The pleasure is all mine, really. I feel lucky to get to know you and hopefully spend time with you after the term. You are an incredible girl, and alluring in every way, attractive intellectually, emotionally, and physically. I would want to hang out with you, no matter where I knew you from." This kind of dialogue continued for quite some time. I truly believe that we had some kind of out of this world connection, on a literary level. By this time, he had asked me for my phone number, so that he could better communicate with me about my writing. I agreed. I saw him as a mentor that I could have for life, someone that would guide me through my writing woes and success, and of course, the oh so eloquent word vomit of excessive compliments. Being shoved down my throat didn't hurt either. He had me completely brainwashed. I just didn't know it yet. He would call me on the phone, and tell me that I was a force of nature, a force to be reckoned with, and that I was going to do great things in this world. I was at a loss for words. He also ran a pseudo dead poet society at night. In a rented-out classroom on campus, he had implored for me to attend for quite some time, and when I found the time, I stopped by for an afternoon. However, something felt different that night. The classroom was filled with other students. His eyes seemed to linger on me for just a tad too long. His smirk resurfacing every time I would laugh at one of his jokes, and after the meeting. I scurried back to my dorm, and was met with a text message regarding how distracted he was by how I looked that night, and how it was such a sweet and seductive pleasure to have me be in his presence. That night, it hit me. Had I gotten into more than I could handle? My head felt fuzzy, my hand shook, and I sent a single text message that ended up being the literal definition of a game changer. I debated sending this message for a good ten minutes. What if I was misreading his advances? I would hate to make class awkward by assuming anything. I went for it anyway. Do you have feelings for me? And this was his response. You are beautiful, provocative, and talented. Of course, of course, I have romantic and sexual thoughts about you. It would be an insult to both of us. To even pretend I didn't, but it is really cool that it is deeper than two, and we can still have an awesome, meaningful relationship right now and figure out the more personal, romantic, and sexual stuff as we go along. I guess what I'm trying to say is, being attracted to you does not blind me from the cool connection we already have, but yes, I am of course attracted to you. And I would be a liar if I pretended that I was not thinking of how nice it would be to kiss you. The first thing that came to my mind was, "Am I the only one?" I wanted to know if this was the kind of behaviour that he participated in often, so I made some sort of sarcastic and smart-ass resort as to whether or not he frequents in picking up his students. I was met with a reply. I certainly don't frequent in picking up students, and I don't think of you in that way anyway. The truth is, I'm not into you because you're a student. I'm into you because of who you are. I would have been no matter what, and I kind of see it as a grand coincidence that you happen to be a student at the university that I am a professor at. I would find out a year later. That being a student was exactly what he was attracted to. You see, there was never any coincidences here. 
there are no such thing as coincidences. We did not meet under the instance of fate. This was a calculated formula, years mastering and practicing, and I was just his latest victim, who majored in naivety. He purposefully sought out women that were young, attractive, vulnerable, and under his command as a power figure. He sought out the writers, the young women who were drenched in the smell of hopeless romanticism, the kind of women that would become weak at the knees for his kind of text message poetry. This was the game he played for years, and he would continue to play it for years after we parted. That night I fell asleep, phone in hand, and I woke up to tens of missed messages. The telling of these kind of feelings is always better in person, but even better than that, the kind of unscripted spontaneous reactions and looks on faces, the nervous movings of hands and feet or whatever, those are pretty cool and always better in person. One thing about me that you must know, sex is just boring and stupid if it's only physical. You are insanely sexy. But the truth is, I'm over that. Because if there wasn't some inexpressible thing there with it, it would bore me in about five seconds. Yes, you are sexy, and evoke a physical reaction, but that doesn't matter. You are alluring to all of my senses and mind, and my heart. And that is what's cool, and it's what makes your physical beauty and sex appeal matter. God. What I confess to you makes me want you even more. It's an intoxicating feeling that is not all just physical. It has this artistic, passionate quality too. After reading that, I felt nauseous. I contemplated responding and putting it off for a few hours. What have I gotten myself into? I was wet with more messages as time passed. He said, and I must tell you, that as I went to sleep, I had this amazingly intense desire to be really deep inside you as I kissed you softly. Your lips, your neck, your chest. But the thing was that it wasn't it at all. It was coupled with an equally intense desire to hear your voice softly in my ear afterwards. To just talk and laugh and be. I felt as if I was in over my head with this. I began drinking whole bottles of wine before class, not being able to look at him in the eye. That goddamn smirk of his. It would follow me around the classroom like a plague, and about a month later of me avoiding him outside of the classroom, my drinking had worsened. I had been prescribed Xanax for the anxiety that I was feeling, and one night, I almost finished half a bottle of those nasty little blue pills when I received a text message from him. Come over. We need to talk. I needed this to be over, and made my way to his chance. The warm embrace of the drugs and the wine in the back of my throat told me that everything was going to be okay. I got behind the wheel of my car and plugged the address he gave me into my phone's GPS. When I arrived, he led me inside and locked the door behind us. The apartment was nothing but one big room with the world's smallest couch resting on the side. My eyes widened. I could die here, I thought. The drugs seeped deeper into my bloodstream as I shook off the thought. He showed me the bedroom, a dirty mattress propped up against the wall with a box television set on the floor next to it that was loudly streaming an episode of South Park. I asked for water and he told me to take a seat. Now, when I tell you about this couch, it was small, and it was the only place to sit in the whole apartment. I think small might be an understatement. The couch was made so if two people sat on it together, they would be forced to touch legs, touch sides, and touch arms. Thinking back on it, I wouldn't even be surprised if that couch wasn't some sort of calculated purchase to ensure his entrapment succeeds. 
I sat on the armrest side of the couch to avoid having to actually sit together. He gave me a glass of water, and I chugged it, and he asked if I was nervous as he smirked. He talked about his family, about novels he had read, about his bookshelf, about where he had travelled to, and he asked me about my roommates, and seemed uneasy when I told him that they knew the address of his apartment just in case I didn't return. He told me about his feelings for me. I sat in silence and drank water. He excused himself to go to the bathroom, and I could hear him peeing just feet away. What have I done? Exiting the bathroom, he made for his seat on the couch once again. Except, instead of sitting down, he walked past his seat and lunged towards me, grabbing the back of my head and pulling my face up towards his. He kissed me. It was wet, it was sloppy, and I pulled my head away and looked to my feet. For some reason I will never understand, I said, I'm sorry. I asked to leave, and he walked me to my car. As I pulled out of the apartment complex parking lot, he followed my car halfway down the road, smirking and waving. I got back to my dorm room that night, after meeting him in his apartment. I locked my bedroom door and cried. A text message appeared on my phone. My dear, you are an impossible woman not to kiss. I feel silly telling you how amazing it was to be with you, because it is beyond expression. Every hour has been a fight against the will and logic to not plead with you to come back, so that we could wake up in the same bed, smelling like each other, tasting like each other. Being next to you is intoxicating. Kissing you was a wonderful feeling. It made me yearn to be so close to you, inside of you. Not even for the physicality of it, but because there is the purest, most raw, most real, and deep way to experience the emotional and intellectual aspects of it. What was happening? Did he not see the fear on my face as I left? He was making it seem like we had some kind of epic night of romance that shook the world and the ground that we walked on. I didn't understand. He had this way of convincing me things were happening that really weren't there. That emotions existed, but they were only in his mind. So anyway, after that night I cut him off completely. I told him to only talk to me if it was in regards to my studies, class, or any academic matters, and I was met with this response. You would not like to see me in opportune, non-classroom settings? Well, the went to part is unwavering for me. The wanting to be near you, to spend time with you, when the only noises we can hear are each other's voices and heartbeats. The desire for those moments doesn't go away, and it won't. I tried to move on. The semester ended, and over the summer we had some contact. He asked me on dates, he sent me his writings, and I tried to look past the romantic feelings he shared with me, and tried my best to coexist within his world that he had constructed. And then, the webs he had begun to weave started to unravel. Other female students approached me. Not for any other reason than like conversation and gossip. They asked me playfully if he emailed me a lot too, telling me that he would email them and compliment them on their appearance, telling them that they had such lovely potential and what a blessing it was to have them in his classroom. One girl even mentioned to me that he had asked her if she would sleep with him, and my blood was boiling at this point. I had been so naive, and so blind as to what was really going on. I was not special. He did not care about my writing. He was a serial seducer of his female students, a predator, a liar. He used women to feed his own needs and his own ego. He was an actor in his own play 
and we were all his pawns to toy with. I sent him a long, angry text message, citing that I knew he had been seducing other female students. I told him that he was truly a great writer of fiction for his whole life, his personality, and everything, and it was all lies that he had constructed. I was meant with an immediate response. I am a little touchy about this subject, because of the fact of the matter that I am young and not married. Every time someone sees me talking to someone, they say, Oh, I wonder if he and her are at this or that. And I get that that's just life, and it comes with the territory. But I would never want anyone to get the wrong impression. I've spent 95% of my professional career in my 20s, and because of I've spent 95% of my professional career in my 20s, and because of this, I have more a social type of conversation with my students of both sexes. It's just my personality. But I say, as God is my witness, that I have never created a conflict of interest or taken advantage of that position for personal, social or sexual gain. Even ever I revere being a professor, I don't know why I would justify myself to someone who judged me without a conversation. But I like and respect you, and it is worth to me. As God is my judge, it's the truth. I told him that a student had shown me emails that he had sent them. Emails that explicitly cited examples of him trying to seduce them. And I was met with literally the most bullshit lie anyone has ever told me in my 20 years of living. Oh God, I know exactly what you're talking about now. Zulk's party. That is going to sound stupid, but my friend Pete was staying with me and my email was open as my homepage. He thought it would be a hilarious practical joke to write to people in my inbox. I know how stupid that sounds, but I swear on my sick father's life that that is the truth. I promise on everything I hold dear and holy that this happened. I had forgotten all about it. I'm not going to bring it up again because the whole thing was ridiculous and painful in ways I can't explain. But, just from me to you, as someone who cares about you deeply and respects you profoundly, I promise you that's what happened. Pete and I were best friends since the ages of five, and the truth is, we haven't spoken since it happened, because he had no remorse or understanding of the consequences of that kind of joke. I lost a dear friend over it already, and I only bring it up now because I don't want to bring distance between me and everyone else I care about. I've been over vigilant about these sort of things, and to have him make a mockery of all crushed and angered me beyond words. I swear on my mother, father, and everything in the world, if you want to judge me, even though you literally have no clue what went down, you literally have no clue what went down then I suppose there is nothing I can do about it. It is not science. I wish there was some forensic way I could prove it, but I can't. It's just true. And unfortunately, I have no way of proving it. But it's true. But go ahead and thank you for knowing everything about somebody when you are zero. Absolutely zero. I said that he was a liar. I said that the message was the greatest piece of fiction he'd ever written. And he told me, I understand your feelings on this, and honestly I would feel the same, but you should know that you're being ignorant. When I found out that he had sent out those emails, I wrote the whole thing up and had him sign it, and gave it to my department chair just in case any problems came up, and none did. There's papers on file about this, and I was hoping you might just give me the benefit of the doubt without going into all this nonsense. But. You just didn't know anything about what happened. I'm sorry about the whole thing, but you just don't. I can show you the paperwork, but it's all worthless, and are only going to assume the worst all the time. I'm not a fool, and I revere the Academy. I mean, I was mesmerized by you, and still never said a word until after you turned the conversation in that direction. That is all I have to say. Have a nice night. I hope we can move past this. Remember that I didn't initiate any social contact. I would never have just initiated that. It's just not something I would do. 
My head imploded. He was such a superb liar that I think even he believed it to be true. I was the one that started all of this? This was my fault? I asked for this? This man was the godfather of manipulation. For a brief moment in time, I stopped and thought to myself, did I cause all this? He was good. He was so good at what he did. But I think after that conversation, he knew the jig was up. I truly think part of him realised that I was becoming too smart for his game. Later that day, I received an email. Shit, this is killing me. Listen, I say this with no motive or want. I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge right now that there is no chance of us having anything romantic. So I speak to you right now with no motive at all. Just as a human being who cares about you, please know that I am not some guy who uses professorship to sweet talk to every pretty girl he sees. That's not who I've been in my life, nor is it what I want or ever will be. So please, let's just move on from this as people and acknowledge we can't have a romantic bond. I say this to you only as someone whose heart would be broken if someone I cared for so deeply thought that's who I am. I'm an emotional person, so I take things very hard in every context. And I first just want to say I'm sorry for being combative about the whole thing, as I understand how you feel. I am certainly guilty of liking to hear myself talk, have an ego, think I'm charming, and running my mouth too much from time to time. All things that I willingly admit, and things that I'm trying to work on. But the specific things you saw were not written by me, nor have I ever initiated any social romantic contact with someone in one of my classes. I revere the grace of what I'm privileged to do. And I have been hyper vigilant to be about that grace and to not cheapen or demean the great job I'm so lucky to do every day by using it to seem cool or to try and sweet talk girls or whatever. And all of this just comes from my heart because it matters to me. I'm not trying to salvage any hypothetical future chance we might have at romantic relationships. I resolve myself to the fact that it's an impossibility for the myriad of reasons. But just know, I never did anything. I didn't hear from him again after that. My drug addiction to prescription anxiety pills and alcohol began to escalate, and I started counselling at the school to talk about the professor. The counsellor urged me to come forward, and I was still hesitant. I stopped going to classes, started to isolate, and began partying my life away, leading to me getting kicked out of my living quarters by my roommates. I wasn't at rock bottom yet, but I was certainly on the right train heading there. When I felt like I had nothing left to lose, I sent an email to the campus police briefly describing the situation. He requested that I type up every text message or email that I had and constructed a document with all evidence and correspondence in it. So I did. However, after reading my document, it was pretty much everything that you've just listened to, and more explicit sexual parts, and the head of campus police looked at me in the eyes and asked, Now, you can be honest with me. Are you responsible for starting all of this? And my face turned pale white when I left his office. He called me numerous times to give me further test. He called me numerous times to give further testimonies. I never answered and never went back. It was cowardly of me to just drop a shitstorm of information like that and then bail but I didn't want any further part in that investigation. I did not hear from John again, but I heard he got fired. And it was true. He was no longer on the professor roster. I drove by his apartment sometimes on the way to the bank, and his apartment had a for sale sign on the lawn. I'm not gonna lie, it made me smile. I wanted him to lose everything. I felt accomplished for a time but that dwindled soon thereafter. I would go to parties where other classmates of John would be there and would taunt me. Hey, what happened to John? 
You give him one too many blowjobs? I dropped out of the university and transferred to another school in a different state, my home state. I slowly but surely began writing more. After hitting a horrendous rock bottom, I got sober and shortly after started a blog that depicted stories of my drugs and alcohol addiction. I was feeling rather empowered and bold one day and decided to write a blog post about my experiences with sexual harassment. Now, this post mainly concerned other atrocities that happened to me. But very briefly, I mentioned my run-in with John, the sociopathic professor. The catch? His name was never mentioned, nor the school. All I did was cite phrases that he would use on me. All very ambiguous. Two months later, I received this email. Hey, I came across your blog a few days ago and I felt compelled to email you in response to your post. Very long story short, I'm a student and I know exactly the professor you're talking about in your post. By writing about your experience and sharing your story, you've made me realize how naive I've been and what a manipulative, lying, abhorrent person he is. You started out your post by saying how much you didn't want to write it, but I'm writing to you to thank you. You've helped me more than you know, because I now realize I need to sever all ties with him immediately. So thank you. I wanted to throw my phone into heavy traffic. I was furious. I thought I'd stopped him. I thought that I was getting him fired and that he would have learned. But here he was, teaching at other universities doing the same thing. I knew I couldn't let this go. I needed closure, and I needed to put an end to this for good. After hearing that John was at another university, and at it again, my blood was boiling. And well, this is where I might lose 70% of you listeners that had my back. I could have let this go. I lived in another state and had a pretty decent life. I could have just walked away and said, well, that's her problem, and leave it at that. But I didn't. Something inside me felt morally obligated to finish what I had started. The main reason I reported him was so that he would never be able to manipulate and torment young female students again. I truly thought that I had failed, and that was it for my responsibility to fix it. I could not understand how someone who was fired from sexual harassment could still obtain teaching jobs. I doubt the information was ever disclosed and was just swept under the college rug. I decided to ask the girl who emailed me, Emily, what her story was. This next part is from her perspective. He started out emailing me about how beautiful my writing was, but I never responded because I didn't consider myself a writer, so I didn't care so much to ask him more about it. Soon after that, he told the class he was working on a manuscript, and if anyone wanted to read it, just to email him and he'll send it over. So that's what I did. I mean, if your professor's writing a novel, why wouldn't you want to read it? So he sent it to me, and I didn't get around to reading it for a while. So he emailed me and asked me what I thought of it and if I had any feedback. So I emailed him back and said I hadn't gotten round to reading it yet. So he emailed me back that he'd love to know what I thought of it once I read it. And maybe after the semester we could meet up to discuss it. So a couple of months go by and it's the very end of the semester. He already knew I would be in his class the next semester too along with the majority of my classmates from his full class. So he takes the whole class for pizza, and everything seemed pretty normal. But he specifically asked me about my boyfriend, and if I lived with him, which is the first thing I found very strange about him. Relationships had come up at some point in class, and I mentioned my boyfriend and how long we'd been together. So, he emailed me later that night gave me his number, and asked if I wanted to meet up and discuss his writings or to text him. But I never did. So he emailed me on New Year's Eve, oddly enough, 
saying he was really interested in my opinion and he really wanted to meet up. So I gave him my number and we met up two weeks later. A little at first and then more and more frequently, but nothing inappropriate. By now spring semester had started and it was mostly just, I liked what you had to say in class today, or you looked pretty. He's very good at reading people and I think he knew I wouldn't take any sexual shit if he tried to pull it right off the bat. Then it got more into the, I feel this special bond between you. And if I'm being completely honest, I have sexual and romantic feelings for you, but I know you're in a situation and I respect you too much to ever do anything to jeopardize that bond we have. He then said, I like you too much just to kiss you and possibly lose you forever over it. And I like you so much as a person that I want to be around you. And I know we can't have anything romantic, but I feel like I need to be friends with you. I can keep it completely platonic, despite my feelings for you. And I believed him. So we met up for coffee and pizza or whatever a handful of times, always in public places, because as much as I believed what he said, I still knew something was fishy about him. I also let him know that my boyfriend knew where we were and that I was with him. But his texts started getting more and more inappropriate as I would try to change the subject and just ignore what he was saying until it got out of hand. So that brings us to a few weeks ago. I told him I needed to not talk to him anymore and he basically said, okay, but just know that something is eventually going to happen between us. And even though he hasn't made any moves, it's only because he respects me too much and he's resolved to let me be the one to initiate anything. So I received a couple of emails from him and some of his writings and I would just email him back and say thanks. And he would email me back with that he missed me. Then in, I assume, a very desperate act, he started telling me about you and what happened. He told me about you early on, his very skewed version of the story in which he was the victim. And I took his bait and texted him in response. I just meant to text him a very quick message, but he went back to like, I had never asked him to stop talking to me. Very inappropriate off the bat. So I asked him your name, just because I was curious and I googled you, sorry. And I didn't find anything too curious, so I let it be. But he was being so comfortable telling me things I didn't want to hear after me telling him I didn't want to speak to him two weeks earlier. And then more red flags than normal were raised. So I googled you again, just to see if I could find any articles or anything to tell me what really happened between you two at the university and found nothing about it. And that's when I came across your blog and I had an epiphany to say the least. So he texted me late Friday night, just after I found your blog, and I didn't respond. He didn't text me all weekend either, and he usually doesn't because he knows my weekends I work and the schedule is a little crazy. And he usually doesn't because he knows my weekend work schedule is a little hectic. So all weekend I was going back and forth. Should I reach out to you or not? because it's really hard to decipher his truths from his lies. So as you know, I just went for it on Monday. Then he texted me yesterday morning, and I told him I wanted to go back to not talking to him anymore. So he said, Emily, you know how I feel. So you know, I'm sad when I can't talk or see you, but you know that I'll give you whatever you need, and I want it to work. I want it to be right, whatever it takes. You're wonderful, Emily, completely. You'll definitely be on my mind. To which I responded to, just okay. After reading her email, I asked her if she would ever report him. She was very hesitant due to the fact that her mother was also a professor at the university, and that made things very complicated for her. I know none of you know me personally, but I can't sit quietly about things like this. 
being the victim of rape, and countless situations where sexual harassment or overt creepiness is involved. This really hit home for me, especially when I knew this man personally and what he was capable of. I looked at my phone, and for the first time in about three years, I looked up a name on my contacts. John Carrigan. The following ensued through text message. I said to him, you have learned absolutely nothing from your past actions. Then he replied, from what happened at our university? I know I'm as immature and cavalier, and I absolutely learned and grew from that. As God and my father are my witness, I did. It changed me completely. Oh, so you no longer seek out romantic relationships with female students then, I assume? To which he replied, the truth is, I never really did. Just immaturely liked to flirt and get the attention. Though what we shared was so different, and I made a mockery of it with my ego, and I sincerely apologise. But no, I've grown out of all that stuff completely. There was a time when I enjoyed the mysteries and flirtations, but I've learnt my lesson about such things, and I've learnt what's important. I've become humble, it's quite a thing. But I've humbled myself and been less selfish, and in a crazy way, I do have you to thank for that. I didn't lash out at you even right when it happened. I didn't yell and scream, or even ask you why. I thought it was a bad idea for us to be in touch. If we had been in touch, I would have only asked for a chance of forgiveness. Nothing else. How about the bullshit story of yours about Pete and all those emails he sent to girls in your classes? John said, We react badly when we're embarrassed. I make no excuses. I was embarrassed and reacted like a teenager. Stupidest thing I did in my first year of teaching. I felt so embarrassed. I fell back on that stupidity. I was an immature jackass. And I make no excuses for that. So, you're still baiting your students with your writings, I presume? It's available if people ask for it. You and I first connected as writers. That's where the raw connection feeling came from. I'm sorry that the messed up ego and vanity got to you, truly. But maybe we can put an end to the bad stuff behind us and focus on the good. You can write. It's as simple as that. You're a natural. It's very rare. I replied, I want you to know that the things we do in life, and the choices we make, will always come back to us. Don't forget that, John. At this point, I think he begins to understand that I'm onto him, because he starts off with a new weapon, bribery. He uses my dream career to bait me. Just so you know, and there's no expiration date on this, but I'll be teaching a creative writer's workshop and if you ever want to guest lecture, the offer stands. I figure maybe that's a decent way to focus on positive things and put the negative things in the past. People will really benefit from your perspective. I reply, really? Are you joking? It would not be a good idea for me to be a guest lecturer for a professor I got fired. I would lose any credibility. And I choose what is right. He replied, from my point of view, I think it can actually, possibly, lend more credibility. As it's a clear show of mutual maturity, and no hard feelings, and a focus on good and positive things, instead of past grudges and mistakes. Also, I wouldn't introduce you as, this is the girl that got me fired. Life is usually long and winding. We've both done things we wish we could take back, and we've both paid severely for them. I think all we can do is try to be the best people we can be going forward. That's what I offered. But I respect your position, and it'll stand in years to come if you change your mind. And this might sound strange, but the truth is I've been trying to be the kind of person you'd be proud of. I keep that specifically in mind. It's how I matured and grew out of all my silliness. My head was about to explode as I stopped responding. He was toxic and willing 
to cut open his wrists until all the possible lies flowed out before ever telling an ounce of the truth. Without mentioning Emily's name, I wrote an email to the campus police about John Carrigan. It's probably too long to read out now, as most of the things you've already heard. But it stated what he had done to me in the past, what he had been fired for, and what the student from the university told me. Was it my problem or business? Not exactly. But to be honest, I didn't care. He didn't deserve another second chance to stand up in front of a classroom of people, hopefuls, and mentally pick out his next victims. I wanted closure, and I needed it. Two weeks later, I received this message. On my father's grave, I promise you I have no improper intentions towards anyone at my university. I swear on everything holy that I will never ever do that. I have grown out of all my ego. May God strike me down if I'm lying. Just so you know, he never did. Please, I beg you to stop punishing me for all the bad past feelings. I beg you and swear on my late father, I will do nothing improper. The university just called to say you complained about me. And teaching is all I have left. I told him. One of your students found me and reached out to me. All I did was forward the info and left it there. He then replied, I don't understand. How could someone find you? It doesn't matter. I was stupid and paid the price. And so I'll deal with whatever awkwardness my reputation causes me. I deserve that. That's my responsibility. But I have no bad blood at all towards you. And you and I can leave our stuff in the past and just do our best going forward, right? So then I reply, someone really did reach out to me, whom of which I've gotten to know over the past few weeks, and told me of an eerily similar story. We are only as sick as our secrets. So if there is anyone out there that you need to talk to or apologize to for being a little more than friendly with, maybe that's something to ponder. You get second chances, you don't get thirds. So he responds, Something at my university? I'm racking my brain and I can't think of what it could be. I do talk too much, and a lot of what I say can be misconstrued. But the truth is, what happened between us was good. It grew me up. It changed me. I'll be even more vigilant now. I'll have no non-professional discussions of any kind with anyone male or female. I pledge that. That was the last I heard from him. One week later, I received an email from the head of investigations at the university he was teaching at. They decided to fire him. Emily emailed me later that day and said that John Carrigan had sent an email out to her and her classmates, regrettably informing them that he was making the decision to leave and pursue other things. He told them he would still love to meet up with them in a non-classroomy setting for pizza and to hold a weekly literary group at a local cafe with all who care to join. It was then I realised, you cannot change a sociopath. I am a nursing student due to graduate in May, who just wrapped up a 10 week internship at a nearby level one trauma centre. Most of my summer was kind of run of the mill stuff. Gunshot wound, stab wounds, stage 4 pressure ulcers on long-term paralysed men. And my last day, however, I encountered the new admittant, who staff referred to as the Swamp Monster. He had been found a couple of days earlier, when he walked out of the marsh into a couple's backyard, asking to use the phone since he'd been shot by a state trooper. While the surgeon who admits him believes he was actually impaled, not shot, his wounds were still gnarly. Whatever had impaled him, nicked his left ventricle. So in addition to the wound from his initial injury, he also had staples in his chest. And by 20 hours past his admission, all his wound sites had become neurotic. You could smell this from the nurse's station. He got 
a besides abdominal X lamp down. Since he was 20 litres positive and developing abdominal compartment syndrome, the second they cut through the last layer of fat of his abdomen, his bowels flopped out along with some excess fluid. They also cannulated him from ECMO at besides the well, involving putting two giant catheters into major vessels to redirect blood away from the heart and lungs to get oxygenated in a machine. Opening his chest was an interesting experience though, and he was more neurotic than we thought, and that smell was heinous. I could smell it through my surgical mask. Glad to say, he made it. I was in a small forest near my house one night, around 1am on a winter night. The reason for this is because I was practicing meditation, and sometimes like to go out into nature during sessions. I sat under a tree, and the place was deserted when I got there, and just calmly melted into the environment. I managed to get into a pretty deep state, so everything was sort of dreamlike. About halfway into it, these two young women came in. They were getting drunk and high, and were giggling and tipsy. They sat down about 20 feet away from me, facing away, chatting, totally unaware of my presence. One of them then noticed me and started freaking out. What's that? Did you see that? She said to her friend. Then the other one noticed me, an ambiguous silhouetted lump under a pine tree, and they shrieked. My response in a monotonous tone was, don't worry, I am a human woman. I was in a particularly deep state at the time, and I didn't really think about how it sounded very strange until afterwards. One of them responded, kind of stuttering and asked what I was doing. I explained that I was meditating, and they didn't need to worry about me, and they could proceed with their drinking. Needless to say, they laughed it off nervously, and then quickly made an excuse to leave. We went to an abandoned hospital. There was a large square staircase, spiralling up to the roof, of the outside of the building. Locked steel door at the bottom, so the only way up was to climb on the outside up to the first landing. My buddy boosts me up. I climb over, and there's a sleeping bag with a steak knife next to it on the landing. I call down. Uh, we're definitely not alone here, dude. No, but it's cool says a voice behind me, scaring the literal shit out of me, and causing me to jump and wall around. There's a young, dirty, homeless-looking guy standing there, coming down the stairs from above. Hands up, palms out. I didn't mean to scare you. He takes a seat on the stairs, so I carefully step onto the handle of the little steak knife. Lean over the edge, and pull my friend up. We had planned to sit on the roof and drink beer, so we offer the homeless guy a beer, which he gratefully accepts, and we shoot the shit on the landing for a while. We were talking about the city, the cops, travelling and life in general. He tells us that he's basically a drifter, and has been in town for about a week or so, but a nice guy. Things are going pretty well, when all of a sudden, he asks, You guys are human, right? I hate it when I meet people that end up being aliens, and you never know until you peel their skin off. They've been after me a long time, you know. They don't stop. They never stop. Sometimes I think I should just kill everyone, to be safe. He's definitely not joking. There's an uncomfortable silence as my friend and I realise this guy is genuinely batshit. 
Yeah, man. We're human. We just wanted to check out this place and drink some beer. We're gonna go and make a move now, though. We definitely don't want to be any trouble. He just stares in silence. So we leave him the last beer, carefully, backing up the railing, jumping down and walking away. Very quickly, constantly looking back over our shoulders. The entire time, he's just standing there, still and silent, watching us leave. This place is still abandoned, at least in the last five years it has been, and we've never been back. I'm not a believer in the supernatural, but humans can be deceptive and dangerous in ways that you can't see coming. There was this abandoned hotel I was checking out. I gained access through a blown out window near the indoor pool. It smelt like death inside, and I come to find a couple of bloated dead deer in the slime collected towards the deep end of the pool. That should have been my sign to go. I make my way into the lobby and banquet areas, and come across a couple of raccoons and squirrels who scurry away swiftly. Everything is destroyed. Even the reception desk has been ripped in half. Nothing interesting to photograph, just trash. Neat little piles of trash. After a bit of searching, I find the stairwell. There's an odd noise coming from above that I brush off as rain. I decide to skip a couple of floors because they're probably in the same condition as the lobby. And a lot of the exterior windows have been blown out. I get to four and open the doors, not worried about the noise, as I'm confident I'm the only sober person on premise, if not the only person. As I pull the door open, the rain noise suddenly ceases, completely. I point my flashlight down the hallway to see hundreds of geese poke their head out of the guest rooms. I remember the moment when nothing moved, and we just stared at each other. It felt like it lasted several minutes, though I'm sure it was no more than ten seconds. Here I am, in the middle of a hall of geese of an abandoned luxury hotel, staring me down. Once the initial shock of the sight wears off, I remember I'm only looking at half of the floor. Behind me, the geese aren't pulling a deer in the headlights. They're coming towards me. It was time to go. I closed the stairwell door behind me, only muffling the cacophony that erupted once I moved. As I hustled down the stairs, I realized the signs were there. Goose shit everywhere. I hit the lobby and turned towards the pool where a group of geese has collected, as if they were trying to trap me. Luckily, they're just dumb birds, and I got out of there to find the exterior of the hotel swarming with them. There was one lone sentinel standing on the roof, honking out a shrill command that the perimeter had been breached. I should have stayed to get more pictures, but I was done. Covered in filth from a slip down the stairs, and I didn't feel like collecting fresh shit from the dive bombers circling overhead. I did, however, get the picture you see on screen. I worked IT help desk in a hospital for three years, which meant working a late shift one week out of every six. The first time I ever did this, most people went home between five to six, and it was dead quiet by seven. Later in the evening, I started hearing doors and windows open and close in the building's other wing. This went on until I left at 1am. Windows open, then immediately closing. Doors opening at both ends of a long hallway simultaneously. And it just went on and on all night. 
I commented to my manager the next day that the security guards took an awfully long time to do their rounds of the building and check all the windows were locked. It went on for hours by my watch. He gave me a funny look and told me that there was no security in our building after hours. I'd been the only living soul in there. It's worth noting that the building has originally been a nun's dormitory, and when they moved out, it was converted into a morgue, before getting its final makeover and becoming an office block. Same thing happened every time I pulled the late shift. I heard these noises all night, but never saw anything disturbing. So I decided in the end it simply wasn't a problem. However, leaving the building meant turning off all the lights and then walking 30 meters in the dark to the main doors. I hated that part of going home. My company would put us up in the Shiloh Inn downtown when we were in Salt Lake City. A co-worker of mine was awakened in the middle of the night by the sounds of a bunch of kids in the hallway. It went on for longer than he could tolerate, so he opened the room door to tell them to hush, only to find the hallway empty. He could still hear the children, so figuring they were in an adjoining room, he called down to the front desk to complain. The man at the front desk claimed to be certain that there were no kids staying on the floor, but that he was certain the noise would subside in a bit, and he offered to send up some earplugs. My co-worker was a bit annoyed. How can you say there are no kids when I'm hearing kids? He said, but went back to bed and eventually managed to fall back asleep. The next day when he was checking out, a different clerk made the mistake of asking the routine question. Was everything satisfactory with your stay, sir? My co-worker gave her an earful about the noisy kids and how the other clerk had dismissed the complaints. The clerk looked a bit uncomfortable and said in a half whisper, We're not supposed to talk about our history with guests, but please do Google for Rachel David, and you'll understand what happened to you. We get similar complaints every few weeks, and we try to never put kids on that floor. In the van on the way to the airport, he read on his phone the story of how a mother, Rachel David, had tossed her seven children off the 11th floor balcony of the hotel, then called the International Dunes, before jumping off herself. I was doing my annual road trip through New Hampshire and Vermont during the prime week for fall foliage. This trip I invited my dad along with me in order to get him out of the house and try and ease his depression. It had rained all day long but we finally reached a scenic waterfall. Soon as the waterfall was visible, we saw a few other people. As I looked towards the top of the waterfall, I saw an elderly man had crossed beyond the wooden guardrails and was trying to take a close picture with his little point-and-shoot camera. At this moment, he slipped and fell in. It was a three-tiered waterfall. It was called Saturday Falls and it was gushing literally hundreds of gallons of water per second, and I instantly screamed, Dad, someone just fell in! At this moment, the guy's head barely bobbed up from the first tier, and he was facing my direction. His nearby family and my dad hadn't seen him slip, but my scream alerted them. The guy was no longer seen again. We frantically all spread out through the course of the waterfall, looking for signs of him for the next 20 minutes. It was almost magical how we all did this instantly and effectively, without any communication, as too much distance didn't permit for us to speak. Nobody could call police due to no cell phone coverage in the area. And later, 
we found out that his family did in fact see him at some point as he was being washed down. His body was found the next day by authorities. He was in his 60s as a photographer and thrill seeker. I will always be cautious now. I participated in an experimental program in the 80s through a hospital in Memphis that was supervised by a governmental agency. Patients were supposed to be supplied medicine medically supervised by doctors and nurses that were employed at the hospital and therefore not biased to the outcomes of the study. It was a double blind study. Several of us had adverse reactions to the medication. Tremors, seizures, insomnia, night sweats and both auditory and visual hallucinations. One lady slipped into a coma and was quickly removed from the program. I found out much later from one of the nurses that she died after a severe seizure and it was covered up. They split us up, the patients with adverse reactions, so we would not be able to compare notes. We were also not allowed visitations and phone calls were strictly monitored, with there being no permission of outside mails or parcels to be delivered. I first experienced mood changes, then sleepwalking, and I became combative when awakened. Violent. I'm normally as meek as a mouse, and I then experienced sleep paralysis. The staff viewed this happening, but did not help me, deciding instead I was being a difficult patient, but I was locked in my body and could barely breathe. This black shadow was sitting on my chest, crushing me, stealing my breath, and a nurse plunged a needle into my arm. I knew I was dead. I just knew I was dead, that that would be the end. But instead, I fell into a merciful sleep, during which I was sent to a mental institution. My admitting psychiatric doctor was told I was brought in from a different hospital via ambulance, in a five-point restraint and had to be heavily sedated, and I was labelled as dangerously violent and a psychotic patient. They diagnosed me with schizophrenia, moderate to severe, and manic depression with severe mood swings. I was informed because of my delusions this so-called experiment never took place, and because of my actions that I was putting myself and society in danger and I was a patient in there for three years of my life. I was never paid for participating in the experimental program as promised, since it didn't exist, and I never found out the name of the medication that to this day still causes me dizziness, blackouts and sleepwalking, and occasional insomnia. Sometimes, nervous tremors, but eventually the seizures stopped. I still have sleep paralysis, Four times it has occurred, but that's a horror story I must tell on some bright sunny day. To speak of it on a dark night such as tonight, when all the lights could go out, is unthinkable. I couldn't sue the program since it was apparently a delusion, but note this, my three year stay was paid for by Medicaid. I never even applied for Medicaid. Obviously, someone had done it on my behalf, for reasons which I think we can all suss out. I have searched for other members of the experimental program, to no avail. I thought I recognised one person, a male, several years ago, but he became very agitated and wouldn't speak to me, even jerking his arm from my grasp and hurrying away. The nurse is the only person I ever encountered again that would speak to me, and she was obviously very uncomfortable. I only saw her that once, but that confirmed to me that this did take place, and that it wasn't in my head. I know I will never be compensated, but I still want answers. Why did I have to be institutionalised for three years of my life? What was this medicine or drug they kept feeding me? What was the purpose of the experiment? 
If anyone involved in the program is hearing this, it was in Memphis in the late 80s, and you're more than willing to help me find answers, please let me know. I want to get in contact with you. But be careful. I feel like I'm taking a risk even discussing this. This pseudo-patient experiment mentioned in a conspiracy theory video brought everything flooding back to me. I can't help but wonder how many other cover-ups like this have happened that have just been swept under the rug. As a paramedic, I responded to the call of a traffic accident, which I was told was a baby ejected. We prepare for the worst. We arrive in about eight minutes, and the trooper is on scene trying to clear the area of bystanders and gawkers to preserve the scene. He had covered the baby with a yellow death sheet that troopers carry in their trunk. I lifted the sheet to check vitals and pronounce death, and it was not a baby, but the top half of a 19-year-old girl that was driving a small pickup truck about 50 yards away. She was driving and arguing with her 19-year-old husband, who was the passenger. They were doing about 55 miles an hour on a two-lane road and met an oncoming truck pulling a double-wide mobile home. She ran under the front corner of the mobile home, cutting her in half. The bottom half remained in the driver's seat, while her unhurt husband watched as the truck skidded another 50 to 60 yards, sideswiping a minivan sending it into a ditch, upside down. When the truck came to rest, her bottom half fell out onto the ground. We also found a trail of ribs from the cab to the bed, and down the pavement to the top half. It looked like a movie set. Her top and bottom half looked unhurt, but from mid-chest to about pelvis, was strung along the road. The husband was absolutely freaking out about what he had just seen. He was babbling incoherently, running around swinging at people, and generally just a mess. The witness, who lived right in front of the scene, started having chest pains and had to be transported. We took the husband, and I called medical control, and actually got orders to give him IV Valium something paramedics normally can only give to grand mal seizures. The driver of this big truck was fine, but was also very, very distraught at what he had just witnessed. That was 16 years ago, and I can still remember pulling up to that scene like it was yesterday. I am a surgical resident in plastics. My caseload usually doesn't fall under a grotesque category, but I've had a few admits from the ER that make me question my humanity. Two weeks ago, I got a page from the ED and went down to find a middle-aged man who had 90% of his body burned. His skin was essentially gone. I don't think anyone could even understand his pain levels. This man, was in mortal agony. As I assessed the patient, the ER attending told me that this guy was homeless, and apparently he had been taken to the ER a few times before this year, and was known by those who treated him to suffer from paranoid schizophrenia. And he was assaulted by several teenage boys. One of them decided to set him on fire, and probably would have finished him off even further, had it not been for a local store owner who tried to chase them down, and was the one who called 911. A year before, I was part of a treatment team for a five-year-old girl, whose father beat her so savagely, that her face looked like it had been caved in, or mauled by some animal. We don't have a burn unit at my hospital, despite the fact it's a major trauma centre. So as soon as we get the burn victim stabilised, they are transferred to another facility. 
I don't know what happened to the man. And I never saw the little girl again once she was discharged. I never found out whether those boys were caught or not. And I've been praying ever since that the bastards will be found. Back in the day, my friends and I would always go up to this boarded up hospital and play in it. The only problem was that all the doors were locked and all the windows were boarded. However, there was a shed that you could climb up and jump onto a car cover thing. And there was a window that was broken where you could get in. We had been in the hospital so many times, it wasn't creepy at all anymore. Well, one day, we decided we would go explore the basement that was always flooded. And we would actually try and walk down the super dark hallway that was down there. The water was probably four feet deep and murky, so you couldn't see the bottom. My friends and I, start walking down the stairs into the basement and are shining our flashlights down into the hallway, trying to see anything. All we can see is this thing that looked like a generator and shelves but can't see far down into the hallway. We finally must drop the courage to begin our descent into the water, but something doesn't feel right. The water was completely motionless and it got incredibly quiet. So quiet, in fact, I swear I could hear my friend's heartbeats. My friend puts one foot on a stair that was submerged, and then another. The water rippled as he continued his descent. Then out of nowhere, we hear a huge splash into the water somewhere nearby. The kind of splash you would hear if someone cannonballed in. We immediately bolt back up the stairs. I peek down into the darkness to see nothing, but we could definitely hear something coming down the hallway towards us. We ran all the way to the second floor and jumped off the car covering thing so fast. We waited outside for a couple of hours and heard nothing and or no one. We ended up going back inside and sitting at the top of the stairs listening for anything or anyone, but heard nothing. The stairs were pretty dry by this point, and one of my friends got a bright idea and threw the flashlight down the stairs into the water to try and scare whatever might be down there. After the flashlight made a splash from the impact, we heard nothing and the light disappeared into the darkness of the water. After waiting for what felt like an eternity, we again found the courage to charge down the stairs, screaming and hollering. We got to the base of the water and jumped in, shining our flashlights down the hall, making a ton of noise. Behind the generator was another hallway that was absolutely pitch black. We were standing in the water at this intersection, when all of a sudden, we see a large silhouette slowly moving towards us. It looked like two barrels standing next to each other atop the water. Then another huge splash behind them. They split apart and started moving towards us extremely quickly. We ran and never returned to that place. I once found a man who had hanged himself. I was riding my bicycle on a path at night, and my light shone directly on him hanging from a train bridge, with his feet maybe six feet off the ground. Skip forward a few years, and I'm hiking in Patagonia with another traveller I met. The trails were not well marked, so we kept getting lost. We were trying to find our way through some brush as I was telling him the stories of finding the hanged man. Towards the end of my story, my friend says, look, a pile of bones. Pretty freaked out at first. I thought maybe they were human, but upon closer inspection, we saw two spines and a bunch of rib bones of a helmet. 
which is a Chilean deer. No head at first. They're an endangered species, so we wondered if maybe some poachers took the head, or if it was a mountain lion food catch. We poked around, and we found the skull, and the antlers. They were locked together, and it looked like they died that way. We tried to pull the antlers apart, but they were impossibly stuck. In the end, we strapped them to my backpack, and we brought them to this tiny town called Cerro Castillo. I gave them to this old woman who ran the hostel, and would have loved to keep them, but the Helmul is a national symbol, and I didn't think I'd be able to get the skulls out of the country. The lady was ecstatic, and she let me stay for free, and tried to give me forty dollars when I left. I did not witness this firsthand. But the most disgusting medical related story I've heard from a practitioner who has actually lived to tell the tale is the following. As part of my training to be a rape crisis counsellor, a doctor came to give me a presentation about STDs and STIs. Somehow he veered off the main topic and starts telling us about the things he'd seen in his time. A female patient came in complaining of extreme abdominal pains. The patient disclosed that she was a prostitute. The patient further disclosed that in order to continue working while she was on her period, she would put a sponge as close to her cervix as possible to absorb the blood and other menstrual related discharge. The patient then explained that she had inserted a sponge and was unable to remove it. The doctor figured it would be a rather routine matter of removing a foreign object that had come lodged or stuck and takes the patient into an exam room to perform an extraction. When the doctor went to remove the sponge, it turns out that the patient had been using a car washing sponge to absorb her menstrual discharge and that the same sponge had been in her vagina for three months. When the doctor finally managed to remove the car sponge, which had turned into a black, semi-solidified mass due to the excess absorption of nastiness, it also released a torrent of fluids that had been marinating in this woman's vagina for three months, and the fluids gushed out and nearly covered the entire floor of the exam room. The doctor told us that it was the first time in his 20 years of practice that he actually vomited while performing a medical procedure, and that the stench in the room was so foul and pungent that it filled the entire clinic and made a seasoned nurse who was standing in the hallway vomit. As the doctor was retelling this horrifying life tragedy that he survived, he didn't look a single person in the eye. His eyes were transfixed on some non-existent point near the horizon of his traumatized memory. I am a medical student, and I have two stories that I would like to share. A super obese woman comes to clinic complaining of a foul odor that she's noticed, and yet, yeah, me and the attending noticed it too. A smell somewhere between rancid milk mixed with rotting fish and a disemboweled skunk swimming in garbage. We do the usual workup, take a good history, do a thorough physical as best we can given she is huge and has folds and folds of fat and skin draped all over her including a rectal and genital examination, just in case there was some funky growth down there, and run some simple labs. As me and the attending are discussing how we have no clue what's going on, the nurses come out, holding a green, soggy, mush in her gloved hand, and waves it in front of our faces. I nearly puked right then and there. Turns out, 
The woman was using pieces of bread to soak up sweat by putting them in between her fat folds. Apparently she forgot about this one piece, which then stayed there to marinate in her juices for weeks, as estimated by the patient. I was sent to see if there were any more hidden pieces. Luckily for me, there wasn't. But having to lift up and search every fat fold was as embarrassing for her as it was disgusting for me. This second story. A guy was drunk and fighting with his girlfriend and decides to light up some M80s and throw them at her. Well, he waited too long after lighting one and ends up blowing off his hand. He's brought to the ED completely drunk and having lost a lot of blood. We stabilize him and take him to the OR while the hand surgeons are cleaning off his stump of a hand. Me and the surgery resident are fixing all his chest wounds and one of the surgeons say, wow, this is a mess. Did anyone at the scene find his thumb? No one knows. We continue examining cleaning and situating his wounds and lo and behold buried in a deep wound in his upper abdomen is two-thirds of the guy's thumb if he hadn't have been so fat his thumb would have likely entered his perineum we were kids exploring an underground flood channel there were spots we would climb up and dangle our arms out of the storm drains on the street. But that required crawling up weird diagonal tunnels. There were four of us, and we were about 12 years old, with one flashlight. The walls were all graffitied with a lot of gang stuff, and even warnings to turn back. We just took it, as other kids that were bored. We got to the spot where the ceiling angled down quite low, to the point the opening was so small, we had to crawl to continue. Challenge accepted. It looked like it opened up again shortly, so we crawled through five to six feet of the low area, and when it opened back up, it looked like we were in a large round concrete pipe, with still lots of graffiti. We started yelling and playing with the echoes. Then we thought we heard something, so we got quiet. And then, really loudly, a boom came from the darkness. Someone shouted, You are all going to die. And we heard this person running. The kid with the flashlight ran so fast, and the rest of us were left in absolute darkness. This was the first time we went past the low spot, but the last time we went down there. None of us died that day. The rest of us ended up quietly and slowly walking out in the dark.